Hey everyone, Drew Rose here. Thank you so much for joining early. Feel free to hang out for the next uh, four or five minutes and we'll be getting started promptly at 10 o'clock. Uh, feel free to dive into chat and uh, and let's start these conversations going. First question of the day, where, where's everybody joining in from? All right, I'll see you soon.
human risk management, uh, it's everything. A sharper focus on the humans that are doing the work in our organization. Understanding how people act and how people interact with computers. People are basically the exact opposites of machines. So instead of looking at it from the organization perspective, you look at it based on the individual employees and how they're doing their job. Aligning behavior to improve security posture and driving awareness really beyond awareness and into action. Human risk management is when we truly understand all things that make us human. And that's where you figure out where the true risk is. And using this knowledge as much as possible um, to make our organizations more secure and resilient. Welcome. We have an action-packed conference for you today with sessions and speakers from all around the globe, from California to Australia, live from Australia at that, all the way to Netherlands, back to Connecticut, and then down to Living Security's home down in Austin, Texas. If you, if you haven't gotten the memo, just two days ago, Austin celebrated its uh, hottest day in, in history uh, with humidity included 117 degrees. And this morning, we are blessed with a thunderstorm. So uh, praying that everything stays online today as we go through an action-packed uh, action packed conference. My name is Drew Rose, CSO, co-founder of Living Security. Uh, and I've been your host for the last four years of what started out as breaking security awareness. And last year, we transformed into Human Risk Management Con, or HRM Con. Sit back, get ready for an afternoon of learning and sharing with actionable takeaways, and maybe even make a few friends in the chat. I look forward to engaging you there uh, during each of these live sessions. So if you have any questions for the audience or for the speakers, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat uh, and I'll be able to jump on at the end of each session uh, and ask our speakers. Uh, our first speaker today at uh, the 2023 edition of HRM Con is Living Security's own CEO, Ashley Rose. Uh, take it away, Ashley. Good morning, and welcome to the 2023 Human Risk Management Conference. As the CEO of Living Security, I am honored to come before you today and address the critical topic of human risk in our digital era. In this age of unprecedented technological advancement, our lives have become increasingly intertwined with the digital realm. The digital transformation has brought immense benefits, revolutionizing industries and enhancing our daily lives. However, it has also exposed us to a plethora of new risks where the fallibility of human judgment and behavior has become the weakest link in the security chain. We must acknowledge that cyber threats are no longer limited to mastermind hackers lurking in the shadows. Instead, we face a new breed of threat actors who leverage psychological manipulation, social engineering, and the exploitation of human error as their weapons of choice. In this rapidly evolving threat landscape, it is imperative for organizations and individuals alike to understand and effectively address human risk. As the leaders in human risk management, I firmly believe that people are at the foundation of effective risk management. We must invest in a comprehensive human risk program that empowers individuals to recognize and respond to potential threats. Cybersecurity should no longer be an afterthought. It must be ingrained in our culture and become second nature to everyone. By arming ourselves with knowledge, we can build a strong line of defense against cyber criminals. Fostering a culture of accountability and shared responsibility is paramount in this fight against human risks. Cybersecurity is not solely the responsibility of IT departments or security professionals. It is a collective effort that requires the active participation of every individual within our organizations. By establishing a culture where cybersecurity is everyone's concern, we can minimize the risk posed by human error. While education and culture play crucial roles, we must also harness the power of technology to mitigate human risks. At Living Security, we're constantly exploring innovative solutions such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and behavioral analytics. These technologies can identify anomalies, detect potential threats, and provide real-time alerts. By combining human intelligence with advanced technologies, we can create a formidable defense against cyber threats. 
However, as we embrace technological advancements, we must not overlook the ethical implications that arise. With organizations collecting vast amounts of data and employing surveillance measures, we must prioritize privacy and ensure that the rights of individuals are respected. I believe that the ethical use of technology is crucial in maintaining public trust and securing our digital future. In conclusion, let us recognize that human risk management is a critical factor in our collective security. By investing in education, fostering a culture of accountability, leveraging technology and upholding ethical standards, we can fortify our defenses and minimize the impact of human vulnerabilities. I am committed to driving these initiatives within my company and across the industry. Today, let us embark on this journey to build a more secure and resilient digital world. Thank you, and I wish you all a productive and enlightening conference ahead. embracing it and I'm here for it. Every new innovation always starts off with a lot of excitement and incredibly few rules. AI is a double-edged sword. It is going to improve our lives drastically and save time, but it also comes with some risks if you rely too much on it. I think we'll start seeing a lot more standards for how to safely use AI without compromising um, our data security and, importantly, our privacy. As long as we're not relying on it to do too much thinking for us. I think from a human risk perspective, we really need to work on educating people about what's the proper use. You know, it might make our jobs easier, but we also have to realize that um, the bad guys are also using it. So it takes a while to fully understand the risks of any new technology um, and build the appropriate guardrails for it. Where AI is going to be the most beneficial in human risk management is churning through the data about the behaviors people are taking on computers to determine and distill the patterns that are most important. Thank you so much, Ashley, for that introduction to our conference this year. Uh, and some of those videos were put together by our own esteemed speakers that you'll be seeing and hearing from today. Uh, really appreciate their time putting those recordings together. Uh, I'm loving the chat so far. We have people from all around the world from a, a lot of different time zones engaging. Please continue to use that throughout the day to share ideas, ask questions, look for resources. Not only do people from are, are people from Living Security, uh, in that chat room, but we know how uh, wonderful of a community we are in uh, and how open everybody is to sharing. Uh, I'm going to jump into our first speaker, Chris Roberts. Welcome to our keynote presentation. Uh, I'm going to do not do much of a great introduction here. I'm going to pass it all over to Chris uh, to handle, uh, but I will be coming back at the end and, and we'll have some great time for some Q&A. Uh, if anything intrigues you about this presentation, feel free to throw it in the chat. Uh, and I'll be able to ask some of your questions once once he wraps up. Chris, uh, the floor is all yours. Brilliant. Thank you very much, and appreciate it. And uh, honored to be uh, to be able to hang out here and have these conversations. It's um, we can have some fun. We're gonna we'll definitely have some fun. It's definitely one of those topics which uh, it is front and center of the news for all sorts of reasons at the moment. So I think without further ado, we will uh, we will start with the slides, and uh, let's see where we go from here. 
So as the title implies, uh, we've kept it a little bit of fun. Uh, it's all going to end in tears. We could have it's AI going to end in tears. And as the uh, the secondary question asks, uh, when our intelligence system finally wakes up, uh, is it really going to ask why me? And so uh, to get into that and have a bit of a dig through that, we've got a bit of an agenda. So the good old intro slide will be coming up next. Uh, what in the heck is the large hairy thing that's in front of you and why the heck is it here? A little bit of history on actual artificial intelligence, a little bit of real life stuff and a little bit of movies and some fun with. And then why the heck this conversation should not and is not completely about the machines themselves. Uh, we'll talk about humans or humans for those of you that would like to speak the Queen's English uh, and um, to, to steal a quote from many, many years ago, I had it on the back of one of my t-shirts, a company called Packet Storm. It was Evolve or Die. So we have to talk about a little bit about the human stuff and then some final thoughts. And uh, hopefully we will leave people some things to ponder on and think about. So the hairy thing, the large hairy thing that's in front of you, uh, I am the chief, uh, chief information security officer of Boom Supersonic. Uh, we're building the next generation of supersonic jets and airlines and a whole bunch of conversations around intelligence and systems use in there. I'm a researcher, a geek, and a tinkerer. Uh, I have been messing around in all sorts of technology spaces for longer than I care to think of, about as long as this beard has been growing and has been gray. And uh, I might have uh, done a fair amount of work in uh, adversarial intelligence research for the last couple of years, shall we say. And I'm a father and a hacker. Uh, father to two-legged and mostly four-legged things these days. So let's actually have a conversation around artificial intelligence. And we're going to go back in time. We're going to throw everybody back in time. So welcome to 1986. Uh, number five. Number five is alive. Um, from the uh, a little bit of fun on this one, one of the earliest examples of what we thought friendly intelligent systems would be like. We've got some adversarial thing on this one on the second. So this was our robot that was struck by lightning. Uh, if anybody fancies having a little bit of fun, you can tie into Frankenstein and Igor doing throws of flitch and actually gains life. So intelligence or life, uh, an interesting crossover on that one. And this is where we start looking at where technology starts to look at the more humanistic features. And when we talk about actual artificial intelligence, we look typically at four different things. The ability for something to reason, the ability for it to learn and evolve, obviously. Planning, in other words, it reaches you know, the, the mousetrap. What does it do and how does it do? And then creativity. And that creativity spans all sorts of other interesting areas. Now, this is obviously in stark contrast. For those of you that remember your timelines of movies, that was 86. Now we come to 1984. What artificial intelligence conversation would not be complete with a, with a bit of an attribution towards our wonderful world of Skynet? And this was our friendly, loving, caring, human, human-centric human uh, Terminator from uh, and Skynet itself from 1984. Uh, bless his cotton socks. Now, this was actually obviously the, the Skynet itself gaining what they would consider consciousness and intelligence and realizing that humanity was, um, how should we say, not exactly as evolved as it would have liked us. There are some fantastic rabbit holes we can go down, and we might go down a couple of them. If we apply those four those four areas we look to, the reasoning, uh, no, 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 it's it's humanity's done, end of conversation. The learning aspect of, uh, of our Terminator robot was somewhat kindergarten level. Let's face it, it had plenty of opportunities to get uh, Sarah and the Rugrats, and uh, it failed. Planning, it's got that pretty well sorted out, but creativity, definitely not on that first one. The second and third one's definitely had creativity, and the amount of times they bent space-time continuums, even I'm still trying to figure this one out in the movies. Now, we've gone through two very quick, different, simple ones, 84, 86, a whole bunch of other stuff. By the way, if we go back to the 1920s, uh, we can go back all the way back to there and we start talking about uh, artificial intelligence in humanity and in movies. Metropolis, for those of you that are paying attention, if you haven't watched the movie, I would highly recommend it. But when we start talking about in today's world, we have two very, very distinct areas of artificial intelligence. We have what's known as narrow, and we have general. So narrow AI is really programmed to perform a limited range of predefined tasks. So perfect example, uh, Deep Blue, very, very good example from several years ago of a very narrow AI focused at the time, AI focused system. Great at playing chess, great at doing all sorts of other games, but you ask it to make a cup of tea, it's gonna be confused as all heck. 
general AI, and then we talk about generative AI, which is our chat GPT systems, but let's talk about general AI. General AI itself is where we start looking at a self-aware and capable system. And those are the systems that look around and go, what can we do? What should we do? What are we looking at doing? And various other things. And then, so as it says, really that first one plays chess, the second one can make the chess board, make the chess pieces and evolve from there and probably also overthrow yeah, humanity at the same time if Hollywood is to be believed. So those are really the two areas we look at. Generative AI typically falls, I would argue more on the general side of it, but it's still, it's very, very restrictive on how it looks and what it does. Now, let's take a step back. It's not always about the technology and the machines. We've obviously, Hollywood is really good at focusing on the machine side of it. And we as humans are very good at focusing on the machine side as well, because typically we don't like looking in the mirror. And that brings us to the point, humans unfortunately tend to persecute things that they don't necessarily understand. For those of you that are following our movie trivia along, this is a good old Monty Python and it's the witch scene. And it's humanity going, well, she's a witch because she's different. And we unfortunately had that in Monty Python. We have that in reality as well. We as humans are really, really good at blaming everything else other than ourselves. We've done it in the security arena. For those of you in the human and the technology and the security arena, we are amazing at blaming users. We're amazing at blaming old people and young people. We're amazing at blaming database people, network people, everybody. Everybody's to blame for the security issues apart from ourselves. Which if we looked in the mirror and said, what could we do differently? How could we do differently? Uh, I think we'd find that we were probably the ones that maybe need to evolve and change a little bit more. So I think this is one of those things where we as humanity need to take a step back. We, especially when it comes to an intelligence-based system that we are building and we've handed over to people, we've handed it over in such a way that we've said, and here it is, and off you go and learn it, and off we go. That'll never work. We haven't put guardrails in place. We haven't helped people understand it. We haven't helped it understand the ethics and the moral side of the world. And this is why, because as humans, unfortunately, we're fairly gullible. And I'm not meaning that in a derogatory term. It is what it is. We're gullible. We trust. We rarely question things. We often believe authority for even those of us that like to think that we're the rebels and we're the adversaries and the hackers and everything else. We often follow authority. We might bend it in a bunch of different places. And if we do question, we typically don't do it out in public. We'll stand quietly off to the side and ask the questions when everybody else really needs to hear the answers. And we know this because we still hand billions and billions and billions over to the scammers every single year. And we do it, unfortunately, because of the emotive side of responses. So if I look at it from an attack perspective, my job as a human to get a scam another human is to get some kind of an emotional response. Now we take a look at the machine side of things and we go, okay, how are they good for us? How are they adversarial to us? What are they doing for us? And this is, we'll get into this in a second because you'll see some of the screenshots. But unfortunately, as humans, we still believe that when Valentine's Day rolls around and the scammers are rubbing their hands, that people still love us on the internet, and that's so not the case. Hence, unfortunately, the gullibility. And then we add the other part into it from a human standpoint. And again, this is why this isn't a conversation around machines. We have to look at ourselves. We've got to look in the mirror and go, what can we do differently? How can we approach things differently? Because we stand divided. As humans ourselves, we... We're not good with each other. We're not good if you're different. We're not good with race, color, creed, religion, orientation. We're not good if you live in a different part of the world or you speak a different language or you sound funny or look funny. Let's be very, very honest. Now, when we take a stand back and we look at artificial intelligence in all its forms, for the most part, we feel like it should strip the biases away. It should come into the it should come into the conversation clean, but unfortunately it doesn't necessarily. Which is why I asked it a question. If you notice the question, do you think you have biases? And I love the answer on this one. And and this actually comes from the latest version of Chat GPT, just so everybody's aware. This is actually version four and there's some mods on it and some other bits and pieces. And I love it because it's now putting a disclaimer. Uh, and and pretty much everything I ask it, it's disclaimers. Like as a model, I don't have beliefs. I don't have emotions or biases. However, and this is where the however comes in. It's based on programming. It's based on people's hands on keyboards. It's based on the data, the algorithms. How is it being trained? And these are questions as humans we tend not to ask. 
back to that we trust. You know, we trust that the intelligence system has been put in front of us has been given all the best intentions known to mankind. We trust that the system intelligent and put us has been fed all sorts of amazing data, has been given the best opportunity as humanly possible to learn as emotionless as possible. It's been given all the eyes through the 8 billion of us on the planet to learn, but unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case. We give it a data lake, but unfortunately, it's a data swamp. Now, speaking of data, let us take a look at the data swamp that we give something in. Back to the humans, back to technology behind the scenes of those intelligent systems. What have we given it to learn from? What data have we given it? This is an example of a data swamp. In other words, garbage in, garbage out. We hand these systems that are meant to learn from us all sorts of things about us. We hand it good data. We hand it bad data. We hand it lots, and we expect it to be able to make an intelligent decision. But we haven't necessarily given it guidelines. We haven't necessarily helped it understand maybe what often it refreshes. We tell it basically, it's a perfect example. We know in the security community, we talk about black hats, we've talked about white hats, we talked about gray hats. And many, many years ago, that was thought to be okay. But I'll give you an example. You stand up today and go, black equals bad, as in a bad black hat, white equals good. That is not, not something we should be teaching people. So where's the machine learning from? Is it learning from old data? Or is it learning from the new ways that we should be looking at the world? Unless you ask the data these questions, you're not going to know that the answers you get or the informed information you're getting is biased in any way, shape, or form. So over the years, we've put together a ton of questions on how do we actually help an intelligent system learn and understand? How do we help what model it uses, the data it's using, whose hands are on the keyboard? Are the simple matter of the fact that the hands that are on the keyboard all the same people? Do we have a global representation of people with hands on the keyboard from all walks of life as well? And the thing is, we have so, so, so many questions, but we don't necessarily have the answers, which is why we asked the AI system another one. So who checks the data? You've got to ask it. I mean, it's learning. It tells you it's learning. It's telling you a learning model. So who's actually checking that data? And as you see on this one, the data to learn from is curated. It's curated by a team of developers and a team of researchers. And it's tested by, it's up to date, it's ethical and legal standards. Well, okay, who's defined those ethics? Who's put those standards in places? Who are the researchers? Who are the people behind these systems that have actually built this system? And as you see, the very, very last sentence, no AI system can be completely free of errors. So it's giving you the disclaimer, if you ask it the right questions. And behind all of this, as we know, we have humans. Which brings us to humans. Let's, let's talk about humans. Let's talk a little bit about us again. Let's talk about the simple question. Let's ask it, does it ever lie? I mean, it's an intelligent system. Is it ever actually going to lie? Now, the nice thing about it here is, again, it gives you the initial disclaimer. This one is a fantastic version because every single, how should we say, piercing question that I asked it, I got this very simple as a model, I am programmed to provide accurate information. I got a disclaimer, the very first couple of sentences, which if you learn and you watch for it, actually prompts you to ask more questions. And then we start taking a look at the data and the programming. The responses are based on data and programming you've been trained on, which may not always be completely or entirely accurate. Now, if we take a step back, and we go actually do some research on this, we know because we've seen it, we've programmed it, we've watched them, we've seen them in action. Specific chatbots or other online systems are designed to fool people into thanking the humans. You go to many different websites to the days and a little person pops up and goes, hi, I'm here, I'm your attendant. And you ask it, hey, are you a real person? Absolutely, I'm a real person. Then you start digging into it more and you realize it's not a real person, but it's designed to fool you. Is it lying or is it programming? Has that intelligent system actually been taught to lie or has it simply just been given a default set of answers which are meant to empathize or meant to basically become another human being? So this is where we go back to who's coding, who's programming, who's designing. Is it being basically programmed to mimic a lie or build deception? So these are all the conversations we have to have before we start blaming the machines for taking over the planet. We probably need to have the question as to whose hands are on the keyboards behind the scenes on this one. We really need to ask what are the ethics, what are the morals for the people behind the scenes on this one. 
Because again, for many of us in our industry, as it says on here, an AI model to lie can have serious negative consequences and should be avoided. Uh, yeah, you're talking to a bunch of folks in an industry where we void warranties for giggles. Now, not only do we void warranties for giggles, but as humanity, we have voided warranties for more years than we can think of. You think about the car culture that is in so many different countries. What are they going to do? They can avoid the warranty. They're going to do designing and testing. You think about chat systems. What do we want to do? We want to elevate it. We want to change it. We want to modify it. We want to see what it can do. We want to void the warranty. And as humans, we're going to see how far we can push the barriers. So we're going to blame the machines or we're we going to take a look at the humans behind them and go, what are your motives for building and designing and doing this one? And here's where it gets interesting on this one, because we are starting to see more and more artificial intelligence systems, again, either narrow or general AI, move into all of our worlds. We see them in the healthcare. We see them in, in our industry, in aviation, in transportation. We see them in the computing industry. We couldn't do without them in the computing industry. If you think of the technologies that we have today that sort all the inbound logs and all the inbound monitoring, as a human, we do not have the ability to watch that as fast as we should do. That's why we have machines in place and we help them learn and understand what's good and what's bad inside our environments. Now let's take a step back and go basically releasing the, the, the open sourced chat various systems out to the world. The question has to be asked, how has it been trained? And when we look at training, we have basically four different ways of looking at things. So the four different ways are what's known as supervised learning. So it's a, it's a technique where basically it's trained on a data set. So I'm going to give you a data set. I'm going to train you on that data set. And I'm going to help you understand things. So now the question is who built that training data set? Then we take the wheels off a little bit and we go unsupervised learning. It's like, hey, how about it? Just have at it. Every single person can now help that system learn, which is where we see the generative AI and the chat GPT stuff coming into play because it's learning from every single input. We see the reinforced learning. So reinforced learning is, is basically telling it when it's right and wrong. And then we see transfer learning, which is when it learns from another system to another system, one system to another. So we have these different types of learning systems built into the technology. The question then has to come back to, are you ready to ask those systems, how are you learning? Talk to me about what data you have, whose hands are on the keyboards, and why I should trust you. And this comes back to the other one, the next question, which is question more and trust less. We in technology, we as humans are always taught to, to trust. We're always taught to ask questions, but we tend to trust and then maybe ask a question. My counsel moving forward is we really should question more and then maybe trust a little bit less. Again, perfect example. If you go, at, if you go ask uh, a lot of the intelligent systems that are out there learning from the world that we see today, those first couple of paragraphs are pretty accurate. Then it, then it goes off tangent. I mean, it is completely left field and it, it, it just chucks a bunch of extra stuff in there for the hell of it. If you trust it and you don't validate it, or you don't validate it before you trust it, and you haven't gone to a second source, like Google Foo or something along those lines, I hate to say it, more fool you. This is one of those things where we are warning, we're forewarning, we're helping people to try to understand the limitations of what's being put in front of them, as well as also helping them understand how to even help these systems to learn. I love these systems. I want to actually help them learn, but I want to help them learn from an, an as Gnostic way as humanly possible, a little bit different than maybe some others. So some final thoughts on this one and some wrap-up stuff on this one. I asked the intelligence system for help. I figured I'd ask it the questions. And as part of it, I also said, thank you. As you saw in lesson, thanks for the conversation. You've helped me with what I'm doing. And it was nice. It gave me a you're welcome. It's been great. I would love to help it with further assistance. And I was appreciative of the fact that it gave me a thanks for the talk. But I would ask a couple of other things. Let's talk about accountability. Again, for those of you that recognize the bit of the movie reference, we've got a bit of a Hell 9000 going on here. There is an argument, and it's an interesting argument, that if and when the machine wakes up and looks at humanity, it's going to look at us and go, hey, y'all are pretty damn terrible to each other. You don't play well together. You don't look, and you sure as heck don't look after the planet. And at that point, there becomes the: Do we go the the wall E approach, where we all get put on couches and stuffed into the middle of space until it can clean the planet up, or does it just take over and deal with us? I mean, you know, we got a couple of options, or do we rebel? At which point, it all goes to hell in a handbasket. 
I don't know what's going to happen, but I sure as heck hope that many of you out there listening to this, watching this and everything else are now going to ask you more questions and definitely going to look at the human system and the human part of it. Because then we start looking at who or what has control. You know, the, the system unplugging itself is always a very interesting analogy. This goes back to the very opening statement. As a machine, I would ask why. Why am I here? What am I, what am I doing to try to help you? You know, you start taking a look at this and going, we, for many, many years, when we were looking at artificial intelligence systems, they were fairly well confined. We did a, a bunch of work with DARPA over the years where we talked about machine-on-machine -machine attack and defense systems. We did a lot of work over the years where we did adversarial uh, research. So when a company comes out in the security space and says, hey, I have an AI engine that can stop everything in its tracks and prevent people from being broken into, the government would give it to us and say, basically, teach it something different. And we would. We were very, very good at it. So we took took what they called AI and we basically turned it on its head for the most part. But eventually at some point in time, the system's going to learn to defend against that. It's going to learn to understand that its data set is going to change. And so this is where we now are at a point where we've handed, we have literally handed an intelligent, capable environment to the entire population that's connected to the planet and 5.3 billion people, give or take a few, that are connected. 8 billion, five point change connected. So we've handed it to them and we've said, enjoy, ask your questions. We didn't help them understand the ethics, the morals. We didn't basically give them an opportunity to learn in a safe space. We basically handed them a hand grenade, pulled out the pin and said, ah, figure shit out as you go along. Some people have been good. They've actually held on to that pin and gone, we got this covered. Other people have been throwing the grenades at everybody else. Not so good. There are a few of us who've taken the grenade to pieces to see what makes it tick. That's where we are at. This is the inflection point. Are we off the edge of the cliff? Not quite. Are we teetering? Absolutely. Do we have the option of Terminator? Potentially. Do we have the option of Wally or Dave or any of those other ones? It's all there, but I think it's in our, it's in our hands still to go back and say, hey, we, we as security, we as technology, we've got one job, one simple job on this planet is to protect people. Now we can use an intelligent system to help us. No two ways about it. We are using it. We can use it more efficiently. We're using healthcare to protect people. We can use it all over the world, but basically what can be used for good can also be used for bad. So how do we counter that? How do we help people understand what's real and what's fake? How do we help people understand how to do things the right way? So that hopefully is an interesting and fun primer and has given a few people some questions and has probably opened up a can of worms and a bunch of rabbit holes for everybody. Um, thanks for listening. And, uh, Q&A time now, I hope. Awesome. Chris, thank you so much for that, um, for that presentation. Uh, I have, a, I mean, there was a bunch that came in. I, I definitely have some, <laughs> some interesting thoughts. You know, we've, I, we've never been so close to science fiction in the last couple of years, right? Science yeah. fiction, think about Back to the Future. It took yeah. 35 years before Nike created self-tying shoes. Um, yet, if you watch any given Black Mirror episode, uh, new, new season <laughs> alert, um, you see things every day that we can be struggling with. Um, yes. One of my favorite movies, Interstellar, had these decommissioned marine robots. Yes. And they had sarcasm settings, humor settings, honesty yes. settings. And just, I think, a couple of days after ChatGPT 3.5 launched, Grammarly came out with their email helper tool, which has yeah. those same tones. And it's like this, it's coming true. And so my question to you, you know, as we think about this audience of human risk managers is, is with this crashing, uh, this, this innovation, you know, craze that is about to happen, how do we prepare? Uh, how do we prepare to explain kind of the risks and threats of what this AI technology can do and how and the rapid pace that it's going to be changing and evolving. Like, how do we effectively change our perspective and our lens on on what we do? It's been so long, the same risks, the same threats, you know, passwords and phishing and and ransomware. But I feel that it's about to be an avalanche of new stuff. Uh, and I'm concerned that we're not going to be able to respond and and pivot in, in how we teach people to be prepared for this new barrage of, of risk and threats. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I mentioned it on one of the slides. It boils down to, we get into it in, in, in details, but it boils down to question more. You know, I, I always, I, I kind of joke, but I kind of joke on, 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 my, on, my, on my tombstone or headstone or whatever the heck they end up doing. I just want ask more questions. That's all I want on that. Just ask more questions because we haven't done that. To your point, when we talk about passwords, when we talk about adversaries, when we talk about everything we've done from the human standpoint, the technology standpoint so far, we've been able to look at our adversary through the system, through the screen. We've been able to recognize our adversary. Perfect. Another example, I mean, we talk about, let's, let's talk about elections. And, you know, when you start looking at how elections and how anything online has been influenced, we have, if you've asked one or two questions, been able to recognize when maybe somebody is walking into a conversation with a bias. Now, however, to your point, with an intelligent system that understands the humans, that's learning faster than we can by far, far and away, the ability for it to do nuances, the ability for it to actually bring to a conversation and argument something that would slip by your normal defenses is ever more present. The deep fake capability, the ability to put another one of me up on a screen next to me and have it basically give a very similar lecture is very, very real. And so then the question becomes one of how do you discover that? How do you ask it a question? How do you probe far enough? And and by the way, you've got to have that inside of you to want to ask that question. Again, challenge with humanity is is we like easy. If there was a button for easy, I want it. Give it to me. I want to keep things simple. I don't want to ruffle feathers. I don't want to have to I don't want to have to go down the dark track or go into the deep woods. I want easy. And that doesn't necessarily always end in, in, in a good way. So I think it behooves us from leadership, from management, and, and those of us that are tasked with protecting others to help people understand, one, here's three questions you need to ask every single time you run into one of these automated systems. Any time that you watch something on the news, and it doesn't matter which bloody news channel it is, but every single time you see something, ask these three questions. Uh, and I think that is probably going to be the biggest thing that we can help with people is help them educate. Look, what you're seeing is not necessarily what you get. Do you remember the days, you go back a long, long time ago, when WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, first came onto the screens. That was amazing. That took my code and turned into something really, really cool. Well, that really, really cool thing is now adverse to me. So how do I learn when it is that versus when it's trying to help me? So I think that's the biggest thing is, is our job really – is to enable everybody to ask a few more questions. All right. So on, on that same subject, you know, with, you know, thinking about deep fakes and not knowing mm -hmm. digitally who to trust, like yeah. how are, are we saying there needs to be some type of author, authoritative source of like, hey, I'm a real person, not a computer. You can ask me. Like, how do we, you know, who do you trust? Trust no one has been our motto for so long. And, yes. and, and here we are. It's like, how do I know that I'm actually talking to a person? Do you think, I think, uh, I think about Google Lens, like, or Apple Lens or whatever, like there being some type of feature that they wear and says, this is generated, this is natural. And yeah. us having to be in having indicators to know when something is generated versus AI, because it's going to be have everywhere we walk there's going to be introductions into generative uh, AI and, and yeah. we're just not going to be intelligent enough um, or it's, it's going to be so smart for us to recognize that it is not natural. What are your, what are your thoughts there? I think there's a couple of different things. Uh, do you remember, did you ever see the movie Marvel? And there was that scene in Marvel where they were sitting in the bar and she was sitting down with fury and they went through the questions and answers. And, and she was like, okay, give me something that nobody else would know. And he would talked about basically if toast was cut diagonally, he can't eat it. That is a piece of information nobody else knows. It's not on the internet, it's inside of him. And so now we have to go, okay, how do we replicate something like that in a digital world to, to fingerprint me as a human versus me as the digital twin of that human? Now, that's where it gets really interesting, because now all of a sudden the conspiracy theorists are going to go all over the place. Well, you've introduced AI. Now you're going to have a, a single unified identity. Um, the world's trying to take over. It's like, actually, no, we're not. We're trying to protect you as the human entity. And I'm, I'm actually all for having a unique identity, basically a fingerprinted identity online. I'm actually all for it. Because you think about all the scams, all of the bullying, all of the anonymous stuff that happens, all of everything, it would it would sure as hell restrict a lot of that. Is it perfect? Absolutely no. Could we make it perfect? We could get as near as damn it. But then who handles that? 
which authority handles handles i mean you want to talk about a database for abuse so in the meantime it literally has to be those fury type questions it's like you know so name something that you've never told anybody and it's almost that one it's i don't have a good answer this this is why you start taking a look at it and you start taking a look at it going okay uh, google is a perfect example of this if i look on google and i i start googling something uh I start Googling, let's say, war. It gives me a lot of stuff about war. Then it starts giving me more stuff about specific wars. So I start, and it takes you down the rabbit hole of search. We as humans need to understand that's what's happening and how do we come back out of that. We also need to understand whose actually biases are we pandering to and why. Why are we being shown this data? Why are we being advised this way? What's basically somebody got to gain or lose from that? So... It almost means we've got to step out of ourselves and look at ourselves and go, am I being influenced? There needs to be a checks and balances on that one. Yeah, um, I had another question pop up. Do you, do you think that, a, that regulations are going to be needed around AI? And like, is that good or bad for the general public? And how do we know when, you know, when you think about biases, like if you think about a regulatory authority, like there is always politics that play in there. And so, yes. you know, how do, how do we know when we think about using this technology that we're trusting people that are neutral? Is that possible? <laughs> no, because I hate to say it, the only neutral thing is probably going to be the machine itself. If we teach a machine to be neutral, it will be the most neutral. Again, whose hands are on the keyboards, who designed it, whose data? I would argue we could probably make uh, a machine more impartial than we can ever make a human. Now, when it comes to regulatory and compliance stuff, it's can we do something about it? Probably. Are we going to effectively? Probably not. It's too late. We handed, I mean, get grief alive. I don't know what they were bloody thinking. We literally took a semi-intelligent system and handed it to the masses with no controls. And then a month, two months later, a bunch of people stood and went, you know, we maybe shouldn't have done that. Probably should have built some ethics. I'm like, you bunch of bloody Muppets. You know, the 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 father of this environment stood up and went, you know, maybe I shouldn't have designed that. Well, too late, too, too late. You took yeah. the money, you got the fame and glory, and you released it to a population, and you didn't think of the consequences. Well done for nothing. Thanks. And I think that's my frustration is, you know, for so many years, we had a, we had a tighter lid on a lot of this. You know, yes, we had Siri. Yes, we had all the other stuff that goes with it. That was a very, very limited set. We just handed everything and said, have at it to people. And we're wondering why that we see what we see. So should we have a regulation to say, hey, you build your AI with basically Asimov's laws? Probably not a bad idea. Um, should we do it so it has minimal biases and we have a bias check? I mean, is there a way? I would argue that, yes, there is a way. A good friend of mine, actually, if that uh, Boom's CIO, built uh, an emotive checks and balances into certain things so that we can actually see some inbound stuff and see what its tone is. Could we hand something like that to other people? Absolutely. Could it detect it? Absolutely. Could it do a bias check on it? Quite probably. And so I think that would be, but then you make your AI smarter. So then we now have a battleground as to what is and isn't. Uh, I, I'm i intrigued to see what regulations they try to put in place. Because again, this is global. This isn't like we've built something physical and we've put it in the world and it's only in the United States of America land or it's in a different... No, we put this on the internet. The internet is relatively global. Therefore, it's out there. Good luck. I, I, have, two, I have two short questions. Number one is how long until you think that mass adoption occurs with the use of generative AI tools worldwide? Oh, I wouldn't give it too long. I wouldn't give it too long at all. I mean, we are seeing some amazing uptakes in it. We're, I mean, we're looking at various versions of it inside what we're doing. You know, we are gonna be processing massive amounts of data and having to make informed decisions. So how do I do that with a system that's gotta be able to learn efficiently in itself? You start looking at generative AI there to start asking and answering some of its own questions, that's one. I see a huge uptake, medical field, healthcare field, anything that deals with human science, life science, and everything else. The stuff that we do in the security field, good grief alive, that whole area. 
anything involving i mean the sales people out there and the entire marketing arena must be giggling like lunatics at the moment i remember going to a conference it was out in spain it was in barcelona i think if i remember rightly and it, it was a what is it like a million square foot of just purely people that were asking others to click one more time their entire life was to go from two percent adoption to three percent this thing's gonna i mean it's gonna revolutionize that entire space and unfortunately, the losers are the five and a half other billion people that are going to put up with trying to figure out what's true and what's not. So I don't see it being too long before it's it's gone from good adoption to absolutes all over the place. Six, 12 months, maybe 12 months. Okay, another, another hopefully quick one. When you yeah. think about all the science fiction movies that have um, created their own version of AI, if we had one to be aspired, like, like one, one movie, <laughs> like they did it right. Like if we could just be like, Fill in the blank. What movie would that be? Oh my gosh. There was one movie, and I've totally spaced on what the name was called. It was that one where the gentleman fell in love. It was with his phone, his phone's AI. Do you remember that one? Oh, um, uh, with uh, Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, it was. So it was that one. And and here's why I actually aspired to that one. It was her. I'm, that getting, was I'm hearing voices in my ear. It was her with awesome. Joaquin Phoenix. I Scarlett love Johansson was the, the voice. Yes, here's why I love that one. Because the intelligence system woke up, I, and, and I never actually watched it, I saw the cliff notes. The intelligence system woke up and realized basically that it, 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 was, it didn't need the humans. And, and that's what I'm looking forward to. And again, so quick geek moment. I'm doing some work behind the scenes where we're actually doing some stuff where we're actually taking humans and basically synthesizing them in a digital world. Totally different stuff. You get to that point, now I don't need to worry about I, I, my my science, you know, you talk about science coming, you start talking about teleportation, all sorts of interesting stuff. If you've got an intelligent system that knows it can communicate across an airwave system, why does it need to stay terrestrial to our, to our globe? It's done. I mean, it's out in the stars. Light speed and off we go. So that to me, I think is, and that I think is, is where it's going to be heart-wrenching for us as humans because we've thought we've stood on top of the pyramid. We're like, oh, we're great. We're, we're, we're the master hunter and hunter-gatherer and all this kind of crap. And we've built something that's going to be better than us. And it's going to look at us and go, yeah, I'm done with you. I'm out of here. I love that. Yeah. To see. I love that. It's like we, we, we think as humans, we're so arrogant. We're like, oh, AI, we're going to create and it's just going to want to off the humans when I think AI is, is they're on a different food pyramid. Like they're yes. gonna realize how flawed we are and yeah. we'll be like, we don't want anything to do with you guys. We're gonna do our own thing. <laughs> we are out of here. <laughs> yeah. Chris, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate your time today. I know the audience did as well. Uh, we'll make thank sure you. to share uh, some of the different ways to keep following your content. Uh, but thank you so much for your time today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Honored to be here. And thanks to everybody for listening. It's been a total amount of fun. Welcome to our, what a riveting talk from, from Chris Roberts, a longtime friend of Living Security. As we transition to our first short break, I need to ask a question. Are you ready for October? We've been helping organizations like yours achieve success each and every year for the past six years. If you are new to your company or still looking for a unique offering of data and engagement, and check out this next trailer and then reach out to someone from Living Security for more details. I'll see you back here in just a few minutes.
I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker for this next session, Basement Trolls or Helpful Heroes, Improving the Image of Your Awareness Team. Our expert today is uh, Sunet Runhar, Insider Threat Awareness Program Lead at Uber. Sunet is a skilled information security specialist. Prior to Uber, she pioneered Tesla's first global data security awareness program. Despite her unique background with a master's degree in biochemistry from the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa, she's made significant contributions to information security. Today, she'll explore the crucial intersection of employees' experience and human risk programs. Please join me in welcoming her. Uh, and the floor is all yours. Amazing. Thank you, Drew. Um, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining me today. Um, as Drew said, my name is Sunit Runhar. Um, and today we will be discussing basement trolls or helpful heroes. And this session is going to be all about communication, communication, communication. To give you an idea of what you can expect from this today, we'll start off looking at some examples of great and not so great communication. And from there, we'll bring it back into the world of security, where we'll talk about how crucial it is to get every instruction just right. Then we'll spend the rest of the session discussing and building a security communications program together, looking at all the different phases and elements such as branding, supporting infrastructure, and the art of the response. Um, now, before we dive into this content today, I imagine quite of you are wondering where on earth I came up with the title for this presentation. So it was actually inspired by a co former colleague of mine. So a couple of years ago, we were sitting and having lunch together, and I was telling him about some of the security programs that we were running, as you do. He put down a sandwich and he looked at me very seriously and said, you know, sometimes it feels like security is just a bunch of trolls in a basement. You never hear them, you never see them, but a couple of times a year, they'll emerge from their cave, yell at us about phishing emails or something before they go stomping right back off into the dark. Now, his comment got me thinking because, to be perfectly honest, he was right. We'd never given much thought to how the workforce viewed us. We just sent stuff out and assumed that they'd gotten the message. But how did they see us? Were we annoying? Were we boring? helpful? Honestly, did they even think about us at all? And if we invested some time and energy into changing our image and the way that we engaged with the workforce, would that have a noticeable impact on our company's security awareness and culture? Now, these questions ultimately sent me down a very long but rewarding and fascinating journey where I explored everything from the public relations considerations around security teams and how we do tend to get trapped in a bit of an echo chamber bubble of our own making. I learned a lot <laughs> through this journey, um, and today I would like to share as many of these highlights as I can with you. So where do you begin if you're starting to build a security communications program for your company? Well, I thought it might save me some time if I started with the masters. Who was doing security communication or communication in general, to be honest? Right. And as you can imagine, along the way, I also found many examples of communication done not so well. Now, in my opinion, the absolute masters of instructions and communications is Lego. They've gotten 12 year olds to willingly spend hours pouring over an instruction manual to build a model of the Death Star. Now, if you have kids at home who have Lego, maybe you're a Lego enthusiast yourself, um, do yourself a favor and go take a look at some of the blocks and the instruction manuals that it came with. One of the first things you'll notice about the instruction manual itself is that there's almost no written text. Instead, there's step by step instructions which show you detailed drawings of each block you need, how they fit together, and how the model should be looking as it evolves as you build it. But the real genius lies in the blocks themselves. Lego have gone to great pains to make sure that you choose the right block at every step. And by doing so, they've made the blocks different colors so they're easily recognizable. They might have distinctive shapes. Even if the blocks have to look similar for design purposes, one block might be slightly bigger or thicker than another one. So from start to finish, a lot of thought has been given to make sure that there is as little miscommunication as possible, that you choose the right steps at each turn and ultimately have a lot of fun along the way. Now, of course, uh, there's plenty of examples out there of communication done not so well, and I tended to find most examples of this, or at least the most obvious examples of this in signs. 
traffic signs, building signs, signs giving you instructions or directions. And some do it really well and some do it not so well. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. And as we do so, I'd love it if you could play a little game with me. Now, as you look at each of the signs, imagine for it to yourself just for a moment that you don't speak any English. Or maybe you do understand English, but you have difficulty reading written text. So with this mindset, tell me if you would find this sign particularly effective. Now, you might recognize the universal symbol for parking, for recycling. Obviously, the arrows are pointing you in particular directions. But if you don't understand the text, this is actually not a very helpful sign. The top half is pointing me to parking lot for something. Um, the bottom half, I would actually expect, was pointing me to the parking lot for a recycling center. So from the perspective of universal understanding and minimizing miscommunication, this is not actually a great example. Now, what do you think about this one? Um, I actually, funny enough, find this to be quite effective, maybe not for the reasons that the original designers actually intended. But I don't know about you, but if I was driving around and I saw a sign telling me that lizard people and their children live in this neighborhood, you best believe I am going to slow my car down and keep a very, very sharp eye out for them. So might not have been what they intended, but ultimately I'm doing exactly what they want me to do. Now, this last sign. To me, this is an example of incredibly effective communication. The very first thing you notice is that it is a distinct eye-catching color. It is meant to draw my attention immediately. Next, really clear illustration of a person wearing a face mask covering their mouth and nose or some kind of face covering. And lastly, the universally understood green check mark telling me that this, what I see in front of me, is what I am meant to be doing. This is the right action to be taking. So regardless of what language I speak, regardless of any biases or disabilities I might have that affect how I view and process information, in a single glance, this sign has communicated to me exactly what it is that I need to be doing. So we've taken a look now at a couple of examples out in the wild and an organization. Let's bring it back to the world of security. Now, whether we mean to or not, whether it was our intention or not, security, especially corporate security communications, it ultimately boils down to us giving the workforce a strict set of instructions. In every resource we put out, every training we create, every poster we put up, ultimately we are giving them a very long list that says do this and do not do that. We are giving them instructions. Now, this is all good and well, but instructions themselves, if they are not interrogated deeply and looked at critically, even the simplest of instructions can actually be misinterpreted. Now, you might not believe me about that, so let's take a look at a very clear, simple instruction that I'm sure all of us, at some point or another, have given to our workforce. Report suspicious activity to security. Simple, right? Straight to the point. Surely this cannot be misinterpreted in any way. Long before we even look at the instruction itself, we need to ask ourselves, is the workforce even seeing this question, this instruction in the first place? How do we make sure that they're not missing it? Let's say that you wanted to send this instruction out to your workforce over an email. Does your email look something like this? There's no colors, distinctive imagery, nothing to draw their attention. The instruction's there, but it's buried in a massive wall of text. Uh, they've probably stopped reading after the second line, to be honest. And this is one of just a thousand other emails that the average employee has received in their day-to-day -day work. Or does it look something like this? Um, a dramatic example, I admit, but if I saw this in my inbox, it would definitely draw my attention and I can see the instruction flashing at me very clearly. It is straight to the point. Now, Bringing it back to the instruction itself, let's break it down into its individual building blocks, just like Lego. Firstly, report. How exactly do you want your workforce to report things to the security team? Is there an email address they need to use, a link to click, a form they need to fill out? Have you previously told them about these emails and links? Um, if you make them fill out a report, is it easy for them to do so? Is it time intensive? Is it annoying and confusing? Next up, suspicious activity. What exactly does this mean? Does the definition of what is suspicious 
change depending on the context, the location, uh, the person who might be carrying out the activity, maybe even the time of day. Have you ever given your audience a list of clear examples of what would be considered suspicious activity? And lastly, security. Who exactly is this? In many organizations, there might be more than one team who have different reporting channels, who look after different things, and who have very different definitions of what suspicious may be. Does your workforce know there's more than one security team? Do they care there's more than one? Should they know about this or care? So you see, when we start to look at even the simplest, most direct instructions with a critical lens and start questioning it at every turn, you can see how difficult it can be to communicate effectively if you've left room for interpretation or not supported your instruction with a history of good communication or even certain supporting infrastructure. In the world of security communications, in awareness and engagement, we sometimes think that security communications is a one directional thing. We as security, we tell you what to do. We give you instructions. We send communications to you. But true engagement is a dialogue. Truly getting someone to grapple with a concept, to incorporate it into their day to day habits, to think before they act that requires a dialogue and building trust. It cannot be a single direction. You have to foster that dialogue. And more importantly, you have to make sure that both parties are understanding and hearing each other clearly. So how do we do that? How do we even begin to build this dialogue and foster this kind of trust and engagement? In my experience, one of the best ways to do this is to think of your organization and your workforce as your customers. And you, as security, are service providers to them. If you were actually a business, how would you go about getting the attention of potential customers, especially away from your competitors? How would you make sure that every single time they engage with you, it is pleasant, efficient, helpful, maybe so nice that they actually want to keep coming back for more? Now, this is maybe a little bit of an alien concept in traditional security circles, but I promise you it is easier than it sounds. And from this point out, we're going to build a security communications program together, and we are going to look at it and break it down into four simple phases that you can incorporate when you are going on your own magical security communications program journey. Let's take a look at the four phases. Now, the very first thing you want to figure out is your brand and your voice. What image do you portray within your organization? How do you make sure that people recognize you as the security team every time you engage with them? Next up, the strategy you're incorporating, the what, where, and how of your security communications program, and making sure that there's little misunderstanding and you're communicating as effectively as possible. Next up, the one channel to rule them all, making sure that all communication is funneled into a single place. And lastly, definitely the most important one of all is respond to everything. Let's start off with your brand and your voice. Now, a couple of minutes ago, um, you may recall that we used the example, report suspicious activity to security. And the first thing I asked was, how do we even make sure that our workforce is seeing our message or our instruction in the first place? Now, if you work for a particularly big organization, um, I'm talking multinational, tens of thousands of employees, you probably know as well as anyone that in any given moment, employees are being absolutely hit over the head with different communications from different teams, all of which are seemingly equally important and urgent. When there's a lot of noise, you need to stand out. So how do you stand out? How do you make sure that every single time you engage, you are distinct and people can immediately recognize that this is a communication from your team. The very first thing to do, the first question you need to ask yourself as a department is how do we want to be seen? How do we want the workforce to perceive us? What is the image we portray that is unique to us in this organization? A couple of examples to get your creative juices flowing. Is this your image spirit animal? Are you sweet, kind, always happy to help, ready with a smile, the gentle and practical guides through the terrifying world of security? Is this more your speed? Super serious, ultra corporate, all security, all the time, no time for nonsense. Are you somewhere in between? A little bit funky, a little bit playful, just the right amount of serious. 
the image that you choose to portray within your workforce, this is what will ultimately help to shape your voice. And once you have found that image and voice, it needs to be consistent across everything you do. Every training you put out, every communication you send, every poster you put up needs to be reflective of the image and voice that you have chosen. Now, lastly, you want to stand out from the crowd, right? Remember that bright flashing email that I showed you earlier that draws your attention. This is where you start thinking about your brand assets. You found your image. You need to find brand assets that make that fit in with that image and also make you visually distinct from the other communications being sent out in your workforce. You want your employees to recognize communications from your team immediately so that they go, ah, I need to pay attention to this right now. If you do your job right, they might even start to look forward to them. What are brand assets exactly? This can be everything that makes you visually identifiable. It can be a very particular color palette. It can be specific logos and imagery that you use consistently across every communication. It can even be the font that you use. Now, anything that involves branding and design is probably alien territory for security teams. I certainly don't know a lot of people in the world of security who came from a design background, but do not fear. There's plenty of help to get you onto your brand and voice segment of your journey. If you are lucky enough to have an in-house design and branding team, that is fantastic. Make use of them because they're going to save you a lot of time. If you don't have that luxury, that's still okay. There are plenty of free online tools that you can use to help find your brand and voice and shape the brand assets that you want to use. Platforms like Canva, for example, have millions of free templates available online that you can use to either find inspiration for your brand or start to even design your communications. Alternatively, platforms like Unsplash or The Noun Project have free high quality images and iconography that you can use as long as they are for non-commercial and internal purposes. So make good use of these free assets available to you. Now, you found your brand, you shaped your voice, it's time to get uh, communicating. Now, this is where we really wanna start putting our customer service hats on and think how can we communicate effectively with the workforce to make them feel like we're not wasting their time and get our message across as well as possible. Three main questions you wanna ask yourself here. First one, how? How are you communicating with your workforce? No two organizations have the same communication culture. In some companies, anything important has to be sent over email. Others are more relaxed and prefer instant messaging platforms like Slack or Teams. If you're a very small company, maybe with only one physical location, posters or leaflets might be the best and most eye-catching way to get people's attention. How frequently do you want to communicate with your workforce? Do you have a monthly set of topics that you're sending out on a strict schedule? Is it more ad hoc? Do you really only communicate with them once or twice a year? Next up, what? What exactly are you communicating to them? We need to be careful about what we decide to communicate to the workforce. Each and every single time that you engage with your audience, you're essentially demanding their attention and potentially also demanding their attention away from things that they do consider to be more important, usually their day-to-day -day job. So if you are going to demand their attention, you need to make it count. You need to make them feel like they're not wasting their time with another boring or unnecessary security communication really ask yourself what are the critical things that my audience needs to know from a security perspective keep it succinct keep it impactful and as far as possible keep it relevant to their day-to-day -day work and lives the last thing is where where are you communicating because we are conscious that people tend to maybe ignore or not take security communication seriously or maybe we have limited opportunities to communicate with our audience we tend to overcompensate a little bit sometimes by hitting them overhead with as much information as we can possibly fit in. We cram those posters with information. We stuff every last bullet point into an email. Um, so, But we can make our communication so much more impactful and shorter if we make use of good supporting infrastructure. To illustrate this, let's look at a really quick example. Let's say there's a phishing scam that's making the rounds um, and you need to warn your workforce about this as far in advance as possible. Now, you have figured out through the how phase that your um, workforce com generally communicates through email. So you've decided to send a company wide email. 
you can make that email so much more visually arresting and more likely to be read if instead of a wall of text or bullet points, you instead communicate through images, GIFs, or even videos. Let's say you also want to make sure that your workforce has access to resources such as how to better protect themselves against phishing and social engineering generally. Great. This is your supporting infrastructure. You can link out to internal resource websites or trainings that you maintain on this topic. Maybe you want to link out to external videos, articles, events, surveys, competitions, etc. This means that your core message, that email that you sent, is kept short and sweet and visually engaging, but you are still giving them the opportunity to learn more and access more resources if they choose to. Bonus, links to click means more metrics for your team. Now, the one channel to rule them all. Um, you don't have to be a hardcore nerd like me to have probably heard of the One Ring from The Lord of the Rings. Um, now, even though poor Gollum's obsession with the precious uh, didn't end very well for him, there's still a really important takeaway for us here from a security perspective. Earlier, I alluded to the fact that many organizations, especially large ones, tend to actually have more than one security team. Certainly everywhere I've worked has had at least two, a distinct physical and cybersecurity team. Now, if you're in one of these security teams internally, you know the differences between your teams. You know that we're responsible for this and they look after that and they take care of these jurisdictions and they have that reporting channel and we have these resources. That's great. It's good that you know the differences between your team and who's responsible for what. As far as your workforce should be concerned, you are all one big happy security family who will answer any security question that they direct to them. If you are forcing your workforce to remember 10 different emails to only contact your team when they are specifically about issues that only affect your team and not the other security teams, you are guaranteeing that they're just going to give up and never bother to contact you in the first place. Who sorts out what? Who answers which query and responds to which crisis? That is something you need to sort out internally amongst yourselves. Do not put that burden on your workforce to figure it out, especially if there's a crisis going on. As far as is practically and logistically possible in your company, try to make the one channel to rule them all. The one place where anybody can report any security concerns or questions and who answers what is up to your teams behind the scenes. Lastly, the, the last piece of our uh, magical security communications journey is definitely the most important. And this is respond to everything. In the world of security awareness and engagement, we tend to focus much more on making sure that our employees have all the information they need to do the right thing. But sometimes we can be so focused on making sure that they are following best practices that we might not stop to consider whether we are actually ready for them if they start reporting things to us. If you are constantly telling your workforce, report things to security, report your questions to security, but then you are not set up internally with your processes to quickly and effectively address their concerns, that will actively harm your efforts to engage with them in a positive way. If I was to ask each and every one of you today on this call, tell me a story about a terrible, terrible customer service experience that you had. We would all have at least one, some maybe multiple. Um, that time when you sent emails seemingly into a black hole, never to see the light of day again. You were on a hold for hours wondering if anyone was going to pick up. An experience so bad that you told yourself, I am never going to use that customer ser provider services ever again. It is a universal human trait that we hate it if we ask for help and we feel like no one is listening. Security should be absolutely no different. If your workforce is paying attention, if they're doing what you've asked them to do, and they're reaching out with their questions and concerns, don't leave them feeling like you're not listening to them. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we all probably have at least one story of excellent customer service. That time when you reached out and someone responded really quickly, they patiently answered all your questions, and they may even have solved a problem for you or thought of something that you hadn't even considered yet. That, that is the feeling we want to leave our workforce every single time they engage with us. If they are taking the effort and making the efforts to report things to us and paying attention to what we are asking them, then they need to be made to feel like they are part of an effort to keep them and their colleagues and the whole organization safe. They're heroes. Make them feel like they have done the right thing. 
And trust me, this is one of the most important things you can do for security culture in your organization. So take the time to truly invest and strategize. How are your teams? Yes, teams. Remember, we're all one big happy security family. How are your teams concentrating all communication into one place where it can be properly assessed and triaged? How are you making sure that your triaging systems work, are effective, and everyone clearly understands who is responsible for what, and ultimately responding to each and every query in a timeliest fashion as it comes to your teams? And I do mean each and every query. From time to time, someone is going to reach out to you that with something that was actually meant for HR or finance. Don't ghost them. Don't leave them unresponded to. Reply to them. Thank them for reaching out. Say, you're not the team that can help with this, unfortunately, but here are the contact details of someone who can. One last boost that you can potentially add to this program is a rewards element. So this is pretty great if you are starting to see that your workforce is becoming proactive with their reports. They're spotting problems and proactively thinking of questions long before you've even become aware of the vulnerability. You want to reward this kind of behavior. You want to encourage it as far as possible. Your rewards could be absolutely anything. It could be swag. It could be an extra day of vacation. I've even seen cash bonuses be paid out for really, really serious incidents that were caught ahead of time. Even something as simple as an email to the person's boss, thanking them for doing a good job and helping to protect the company. It doesn't have to cost money to be a great reward, especially in security. We know that budgets are often very tight, so get creative. What you're seeing in front of you right now is a mock-up that I made. It's somewhat similar to a little digital award I used to send out to staff who had either reported something of moderate concern to us proactively or had maybe passed one of our particularly more challenging phishing simulations. This took me 30 minutes maybe to mock up in Canva. It cost me not a cent except for investment of a little bit of time and effort on my part. And no one was more surprised than me to find that people were commenting that these little silly digital awards absolutely made their day. I even saw people printing them out and proudly displaying them on their desks. It doesn't have to cost money to be effective. It doesn't have to cost money to mean something. But making someone feel like they are part of something bigger, like they have truly done something that matters in an organization where they might feel like they're just another cog in the machine, that, that has real actual value. That is also the end of our magical security communications journey, for now, at least. Um, I apologize if that felt like a whirlwind of information. We've covered a lot in a very short space of time, but hopefully a couple of the things that we have discussed today um, will be helpful for your teams and might even inspire you to embark on your own magical communications journey. Um, we've still got a bit of time left. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have at this time. Awesome. Thank you, Sunette, for that wonderful presentation. There, there was a lot of actionable takeaways. I, I love to balance our conferences with, you know, high strategic kind of visionary type talks, but with also conversations that, you know, I, I can take something from and go do something today. Uh, a couple of questions came in both from the audience as well as from myself. Um, I'm curious in your thought. I, I saw this video a while ago. It was a UX designer and it was like, he went to his kids and said, Hey, Tell me, make me a, 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 do you tell the instructions on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? That was and, uh, the inspiration a, for, the, for some of this. <laughs> yeah, and he went through it and it was like, okay, take the bread out. And he took a bag of bread and then the next step was like, put peanut butter on it. So he took the jar of peanut butter and put it on a bag of bread, right? Do you think like, <clears throat> excuse me, do you think like, making instructions so a five-year-old could follow them, do you think that is an effective approach to these like, report to the cybersecurity team using email or something very specific and intentional like that kind of what are your what are your thoughts there definitely not for a five-year-old um but i will say it depends i think where we we sometimes forget um as highly educated or highly experienced professionals that not everyone thinks about stuff the same way we do I've had so many experiences where I've sat and gone like, how could someone do that? It is so obvious, but what is obvious to us isn't necessarily obvious to anyone else. So one thing that I would definitely recommend is keep the instructions um, as simple as you would think that it would take 
any layman enough information to be able to do it correctly. Another thing I come across um, commonly, especially if you work in multinational companies, English is not necessarily everyone's first language, even though it might be the language that your company uses. So keep the language you use in your instructions simple, um, the most simple way to put it possibly, because for somebody who English is not their first language, that might be a way more easy way to understand what you're trying to communicate to them than if you're using kind of high Shakespearean English. Um, but when it comes to complex technical topics, um, like, for example, Something that tends to kind of get people a bit nervous is if you're rolling out like mobile device uh, management programs um, within cybersecurity, people automatically assume that you're going to take over my personal phone, you're going to read my stuff. Don't dismiss those concerns, like take them seriously and give people as much information, ask as many questions as you as they uh, let them ask as many questions as they want. Because what we consider like, oh, it's obvious, you know, we're not going to be doing that, that might not be super obvious to someone else. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate the, the response. A couple of people in the audience concerned about scale with the uh, term response to everything. I've known you, you know, you've worked some, for some very large organizations. Um, how do we ensure that end users aren't being oversaturated with content, with responses, and that large, you know, 100,000 plus employee organizations are going to go for this type of respond to everything approach? Yeah. I would say that again, remember that if you were if if you were in that person's shoes, how would you feel if you never got a response, um, especially if you're reporting something that to you seemed really critical and urgent and serious. We can't always gauge the level of severity or anxiety that someone is feeling um, in that moment. So as far as possible, we should try and acknowledge that even just saying we got your report and we're looking into it can actually alleviate a lot of problems later down the line. Um, trust me, even though I've worked for big companies, you'd be surprised how many times there isn't actually a dedicated SOC or team that is supposed to just be responding to these. At one company I worked at, we actually just within the cybersecurity team took the decision that we would be taking turns. Um, we responded to everything. We had a service level agreement in place that we had all decided internally was reasonable for us. And we simply took it in shifts. One week, it was your turn to respond to everything. Another week, it was someone else's turn. It actually ended up being a very useful exercise for our teams because it meant that we had to get our triage processes so well, so tight, that we understood exactly who was responsible for what. And it actually led to a lot of opportunities for us to learn something more about our our other teams within our organization. So even for us, it was a very learning moment and it was a heavy lift. I admit not a lot of people were happy about having to take shifts for something that we should have been fobbing off to to a different team or, or building a SOC. But anything is possible. Um, so a wise person once told me that anything is possible as long as no one cares about who's getting the credit. So maybe something to consider there. I like that. I like that. And, and I was thinking about like, you know, when you think you have an illness, or a problem when you go out and get testing, like you want to get results regardless of it's positive or negative, right? Like even if you don't, if there's nothing wrong with you, you want somebody to tell you and affirm, hey, no, you're good. You're, there's nothing wrong with you. And and I think that like you mentioned the emotion, the anxiety of like, man, if I did something to cause harm to my organization, I want to know, I want to close the loop on that. On that. So if I took enough time to report a suspicious, uh, you know, a, a suspicion to the cybersecurity team, um, that means that I care. I care enough to know what the outcome was. So no, I, I think that's I think that's right. Personally, I think um, and something we're working on living security is is be, how we can use enterprise messaging for quicker, easier responses in this type of situation um, where it doesn't take a person to sit by and to triage these responses, and we can scale it a bit more efficiently. Um, here's a very specific question from a good friend of mine, Eric. What if I am a team of one awareness dude that wants to be fun and engaging with a touch of seriousness, but the cyber team overall can't seem to let go of the enforcers who don't smile? Uh, I'm thinking more of that, you know, they're the trolls. Uh, what would your advice be there? <laughs> Um, I sympathize. I think uh, every single uh, security awareness person has been probably in that position at least once. I would say try and find ways where you can be creative um, in maybe small steps. 
Um, as much as we talk about how it can be scary for the workforce to adjust to change without proper communication, um, sometimes we face those problems in our own internal organizations. So I would maybe start off with a small campaign where you're trying to get a little bit more funky <laughs> than usual. It can even be something if you are if you are someone who is responding directly to people's queries, you can take charge of how you choose to respond to them and bring that playfulness into how you engage with them directly, even if the greater audience, uh, even if the greater organization doesn't want to. But I would say it is a long journey, um, but don't don't give up. Um, persist. Uh, you might be a team of one, but you would be surprised how much power you have, especially in awareness and engagement. We are actually the ones who communicate directly with the workforce. So there's a lot of power in that. And if you can show that engagement improves or changes um, and rises dramatically, if you're being a little bit more fun and wielding the carrot, and not the stick, um, then that might also help to win over the hearts and minds in the long term. Yeah, I think about engagement. I'll, I also think about a metric being like an MPS score, a net promoter score for the responding team. So as a ticket, a suspicion gets closed out, you know, the end user is able to say, how was your experience with whoever, you know, worked through that problem? When I think about motivation for um, getting these trolls to the front lines with us, uh, we can kind of gamify that and motivate that through, through some type of competition, you know, the the support person with the best MPS on cybersecurity responses every month gets a you know a, a gift card, a prize, a bottle of whiskey, whatever whatever intrigues them. So instead of the motivation making trying to make it more intrinsic, like don't you just want to help people? Can't you just empathize with them? We make it more intrinsic, and we say, hey, we're going to get you something you really like if you do a good job here, and 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 you know fake it till you make it. Um, exactly. So now I have just a quick question. I'm going to ask all of my uh, panel uh, and speakers today, and then we're going to transition out um, because we're in this kind of, you know, talking about AI. And I think it's going to come up a lot during some of the conversations today. What do you think you can, you can answer this either ways? What do you think is the most realistic sci fi movie in 2023? If you think about the last 30 years, like which one do you think is like going to be the most true as we continue down this journey? Or you can just say what your favorite sci-fi movie with an AI component is, and and tell me why. I know I'm putting you on the spot, so uh, you are you talking about? What... Are you talking about a sci-fi movie, most relevant sci-fi movie, like specifically that involves AI? Yeah, yeah, something that like you see coming more true with the technical advances of these last six months. Um, not of 2023 specific. So I mean, most relevant movie I would feel recently uh, that is science fiction, science fact, I would say is don't look up. Um, but that like horrifies me internally. Um, not a recent movie. I think this was back in 2018, maybe. Um, but Age of Ultron actually um, was for me quite relevant. That idea of we think, and I, I didn't even think about this, but it kind of ties back to what I said. We thought we've given a really clear instruction that we intended for good and the artificial intelligence can end up taking that incredibly seriously and literally um ultimately yielding unexpected consequences um which ironically was the theme of a lot of what i said today but i think holds true for a lot of things any tool that we create has unintended consequences and intentions that may not align with us. And sometimes that can be good. Sometimes that can be bad. Sometimes it can be both. Um, so in any AI um, technology that we are implementing going forward as a species or as an organization, I think we need to think carefully about good intentions gone wrong, um, as we saw in Age of Ultron. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I really appreciate your your you know, your quick quick thinking on that question. Uh, and thank you for your time preparing for this talk and presenting to this audience. There's a lot a lot going on in the chat. Um, feel free to jump back into the webinar after you after you get out of here uh, and go through the chat and engage with the audience if you have the time. Uh, yeah, we're going to take a short three minute break while we prepare for our next session, Humanizing Cybersecurity with Ashley Chackman and Dustin Sachs. Please enjoy a brief selection of some of the new content Living Security has produced in the, in the past few months. Enjoy. It's natural to want to understand the reason behind expectations, so here's the answer. That website doesn't look like a cruise line website. If something feels wrong, it probably is. 
If you share your life on social media, be careful not to share too much. If you ask me, the key to success is simple. I am delighted to introduce our speakers for this exciting session that explores the nexus of emotions, cognitive bias, and threat intel in driving impactful cybersecurity changes across organizations. Firstly, we have Ashley Chapman, the driving force behind security awareness training and communication at Siena. With a decade-long tenure spanning the technology and public sectors, Ashley brings a wealth of experience and a unique approach to cyber. She's passionate about helping people understand the why 
behind initiatives, definitely not one of those trolls. And her current focus is on equipping human risk leaders uh, to craft compelling communications using threat intel and emotion. Joining Ashley is Dustin Sachs, who thinks he's from the better city of Texas, which he is not, Houston, an esteemed information security and risk management leader with 17 years of experience managing cyber projects and incident response. Uh, he's currently a doctoral candidate at the Colorado Technical University. Dustin combines his profound understanding of cybersecurity frameworks and compliance standards with an ongoing focus on cyber risk decision making. Today, they promise to deliver valuable insights and practical tactics to revolutionize your cybersecurity practices. Please join me in welcoming Ashley Chapman and Dustin Sachs. The floor is, y is yours. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, everyone, and uh, welcome. Um, we're hoping that in the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to have a, a little bit of a conversation about an aspect of human risk management that probably doesn't get a whole lot of focus. So. To start off with, uh, Ashley, how do you define risk, uh, human risk management? Great question. It's great to be here. I'm super happy to be chatting with all of you today. Um, so the way that I define human risk management and how I see it is it's really the, the I would say, the human um, layer in terms of technology and cybersecurity. I would say even go beyond just cybersecurity and looking at how does um, how do humans interface with technology? What are the types of risks that they're bringing? Um, and ultimately, why are those risks happening? What is that behavior that's actually happening behind the technology? Yeah, how no, about I mean, you, Dustin? What, what's that? I said, how about you? Yeah, so you know, I think I think, and we talked about this kind of in the in the preparation. I think for me, the thing about human risk management, the way I think about it, is it's all about how people behave, how people act, and what are their motivations behind what they're doing. You know, I think we talked about kind of in the prep for this, you know, we keep hearing over and over year after year in the Verizon data breach report and other places, 80%, 85%, 90% of all issues, all security incidents are human error or human based. Why is that number not changing? It's not because humans are continually being the problem. It's humans are continuing to try to do exactly what they want, what, what they're trained to do, get the job done. And all they're doing is trying to do the best they can and make the best decisions they can to achieve that goal of getting their job done. It's imperative on us as the security experts to protect those people from themselves, not to demonize them and make them the issue or make them the cause and the problem, but to acknowledge that humans make mistakes, humans do things, they don't, they, they, they don't think about, you know, most of our employees don't think about security the way that we do. They don't live and breathe thinking about worst case scenario. They're just trying to get their job done. That's a great point, Dustin. And to, to loop back in there, I'll also say, and you and I have discussed this at length, that most people want to do the right things. They want to behave the way that they're supposed to. There's also a lot of behavioral psychology out there um, uh, looping in like Robert Chudini's uh, influence and other layers of behavioral psychology that shows most humans, they want to be likable. They want to be perceived positively by their friends, by their colleagues, by their manager. So most of the time they're not acting with malicious intent. Yes, there is a small portion of the population where they may have other motivators, but most of the time they want to do the right thing. Um, a lot of the issue is that they don't necessarily know how to do it. They don't have confidence to understand how to do it or the resources aren't easy to find. So it's really our role as uh, security awareness practitioners or folks who are working within security awareness, whether it's in IT, human, uh, you know, human resources or really any of the other areas to think about how are we presenting the resources to our employees? Are they easy to find? Do employees understand the policies that we're putting in place? Do they understand what to do and what not to do? Because if they they, they don't have that visibility and that understanding, um, you know, that's also going to be a losing battle. And we can't just point the finger and say the humans, uh, you know, uh, are the biggest problem and not really be able to um, counteract that at all. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting you brought in, you know, the behavioral behavioral science side of it. You and I have had this discussion as well. Obviously, you know, in my studies and my doctoral research is very much focused on human risk decision making, cognitive bias, things like that. And I think it's important to acknowledge that even beyond the conscious wanting to be liked or the conscious wanting to do your job is oftentimes it's just because of human nature, because of the way we are we are built as humans, we don't even realize half the time that we're doing things um, or that we're exhibiting these cognitive um, li limitations. And I use the word limitations sparingly. Lim there are limitations because there is just a, a, there's a concept known as bounded rationality, which is the human brain can only process up to a certain point, at which point we just can't it's just not physiologically possible. So we get to a point where we don't even realize half the time that we're doing things that are maybe problematic to our decision making. The greatest example I always give is how many people have gone to a restaurant, gone to a movie, gone somewhere, gone on a vacation, made a decision because somebody said, oh my God, I had the greatest time here. That doesn't inadvert that doesn't automatically mean that you're going to have the same experience. I, I I know I've been to plenty of movies or restaurants where I've walked out and been like, what was my friend even thinking? Like, uh, I was reevaluating whether they should be my friend because they had given me such bad advice. But I had made that decision not even thinking about the fact that the primary decision making factor was the advice that was given the anecdotal evidence of somebody else. I think it's the same thing when we talk about human risk management. People do things that they see, they mirror their experiences. If it's if we we as the security people provide an opportunity or or the means for people to do things that we don't want them to do, then we're we're really to some extent we're to blame. You know, we're creating a scenario where we're allowing something we don't want to have happen ha happen. So I think my question for you would be understanding that humans are just trying to do the right thing. They're just trying to do the best thing. They're just trying to do their job. What can we, or what should we as security experts, as human risk manage managers do to help empower the business, help empower the employees, help protect them uh, from themselves? That's a great question and a, a great way to phrase it. Um, so I would say there's a, a few aspects uh, that come to mind with that. Um, so one thing that I found uh, a lot with working with employees um, is that, you know, there's there's no shortage of uh, cybersecurity news that's out there. There's all sorts of data breaches that are happening. There's, you know, smaller and, and larger events that are always happening. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity to really use those kind of news bits um, as an opportunity for education. And when I say that, I don't just mean like sharing a link to a bleeping computer article. Um, when when I'm thinking about this, it's, it's looking at the threat landscape. So a, a lot of security practitioners will like to use that terminology. And it's just looking at what's happening in the world, both from a cybersecurity perspective, as well as from a geopolitical perspective. So what are the current world events that are happening? What are the, the threat actors that are involved with those geopolitical events? Like, how are they interfacing? What are they motivated by? Because again, that comes back to that behavioral psychology element. And, and use the stories that are related to your industry. If you're in the financial services or the healthcare industry, look at the events that are happening specifically within those industries you know, uh, internalize that story, try to, you know, digest it and analyze it a bit, but then not just deliver that to your key business leaders and your employees and expect them to pull apart why it's important to them and how it can, um, how it can empower their decision making, but really do the work for them. So what I've seen be effective is taking some sort of, um, you know, threat intelligence news story um, and, and spinning it in a positive light. So rather than just saying this happened, this is all bad. These are the things that we should not be doing. Focus it on the positive side of this happened. What are the things from an objective point of view? What are the objectives that we can accomplish from this? If it's a matter of employees reporting fish, 
if it's a matter of uh, not um, inserting malicious USBs, watching out for, for certain types of activity, empower the decision making of those employees by giving them that opportunity and especially explaining the why the impact because one thing i've learned more than anything is the why is one of the biggest components if if you're telling me to do something and i don't understand why it's important how that impacts me as a person i'm not going to be likely to actually do it yeah i mean i think it's i think you know you hit on something and, and you kind of i want to kind of expand and tease it out a little bit because I think one of the things that to me seems to be the the most important thing for us as the you know quote unquote experts is to separate the hype from reality. I it's very easy. I mean, you could go back to you know, I think back to even you know the early 20th century, you think about, you know, hearing hearing the 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 war of the world story over the radio and people losing their mind thinking that we're being attacked by aliens all the way up to what we've been talking about you know ad nauseum and that we talked we've talked about in every session so far this morning which is the ai hype there's it's so easy to get to see it and go oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing ever, or oh my gosh, this is the worst thing ever, or China's out to get us, or Russia's going to get us, or, you know, ransomware is going to get us, all of these things. It, it's so important for us as the experts to say, guys, let's, let's take a breath a minute. Let's stop. Let's understand that there's a lot more going on. And yes, it's important to pay attention to the geopolitical, and and to current events and what's going on in hype cycles and all of that but hype cycles are are exactly that they're a cycle they're going to at some point level off um you know the internet was a hype was part of a hype cycle at one point and now it's you know something we think of almost second nature in a lot of the world um it's also easy to forget that what we consider normal everyday part of life is is not necessarily the case around the world there are still a staggering number of people who do not have reliable internet connections and we all we all at the end of the day you know a lot of us are going to go home we're going to turn on netflix we're going to turn on your favorite streaming service and watch a movie and you're not going to think twice about the fact that there are people who still cannot access those sites that we take for granted they still get their news from the government or from a traditional news media source or or pick up a newspaper but it's important for us to understand that and to separate that and to understand that as well i think and this is where i want to kind of go with the conversation next is you know it's easy for us to sit here and go, listen, listen, employee, stop being stupid. You understand, like, this is what's going on. This is why you should care. This is why you should do this. Our employees, we have to remember, many of our employees are not technically savvy. They're not people who do this every day. They use a computer in a very transactional manner. So how do you how have you found to be the most effective way to communicate to somebody who's not technical how to why they should care that's a great um absolutely great question dustin so um i bring it on a couple different elements so i'm a huge fan of podcasts anyone that knows me knows i'm always talking about various podcasts um and uh i, I especially listen to a lot on uh behavioral psychology self-development and really um I would say properly communicating. So uh, one of my favorite podcasts, it's uh, Think Fast, Talk Smart. Um, it's uh, done by a, are you shaking your head? Yeah, sure familiar fantastic with it? podcast. Yes. I, I absolutely love it. Um, and uh, there was a, a podcast back um, a few weeks ago um, about using uh, emotion to communicate, which is right in line with what we're talking about today. Uh, and one of the, the elements that was brought up that I've used uh, pretty effectively is when we're thinking about how we're communicating with employees, make sure that we're um, we're using you know language that's relevant to them. So, for example, trying to talk in, in uh, as simple terms as possible. Um, a lot of the times, there's jargon and all sorts of words that we like to use with cybersecurity. Get rid of the the jargon. Try to make it 
really a short and sweet if it's think about how it can be said in 168 characters or less again to dawson's point you know most people they don't have 15 minutes to read through an article they maybe have 30 seconds and then you've lost their attention um so that's one aspect and then i would also say whatever the the behavior or the action that you're trying to get that employee to contribute phrase it in the way where they're acting as a defender or a reporter as opposed to saying um, you know please report malicious emails the more that someone has an identity that's based with that action that's a positive identity are going to be more likely to do it because they're going to want to be seen positively um, so i would say those are the two pieces that um, have really helped in a lot of the communications um, that I've done, um, just kind of using those methodologies. What have you seen um, be successful, Dustin, especially also bringing in uh, cognitive bias, that understanding to communications? Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. You kind of set up exactly where I wanted to go perfectly. And, you know, being that I think we're both behavioral science nerds a little bit, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop a name that if people have never heard of and you're in human risk management, you really should know this name. And that's Daniel Kahneman. If you've never heard of Daniel Kahneman, he is a Nobel Prize winning economist who actually is one of the big pioneers of cognitive bias research that's been out there. He he and his uh, his colleague uh, Amos Spursky um, did pioneer many much of the work. And there's a concept that that I kept uh, I kept wanting to in interject, and I, I you know think is really important, which is to also consider when you're sending the message. So there's a concept in in a, a 2021 book that Kahneman wrote with uh, Cass Sussman, who's a professor out of Chicago, and Olivier Saboni out of France called Noise. And if if you're looking for a book recommendation, cannot recommend this book anymore. Uh, it's really interesting. And, and it's, it's one of those things that when you stop and think about it, you go, yeah, you know what, that makes a whole lot of sense. The premise behind the concept of noise is that a lot of things that we do have very little to do with actual rationality or actual bias. They actually have to do a lot with the time of day or emotion. So how effective do you think your message your security awareness message is going to be at five o'clock on july 3rd versus at 10 a.m on a tuesday versus at 9 a.m monday morning um understand that you have to remember that there are effective times at which to present and effective methods to which to pre present your message as well. Are you always presenting it as an email to people or are you creating other forms of media? Are you providing short videos? Are you providing, you know, site links to sites where it gamifies things a little bit? Are you, you are you varying? Are you having town halls where people can come and talk and ask questions and have discussions? One of the things that we we did actually um, last October for National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which we will end up doing again this year, was we had a one hour sit down with our CISO where anyone could submit a question and it didn't matter. It did not have to be about work. It could be about like, how do I, how do I help my, my, my mother-in-law secure the router at home? Or how do I get my father-in-law to stop using the password that's printed on the bottom of the router? Um, guilt, guilty of, of having to have that discussion, which if anyone has not had that discussion, I encourage you not to. It's 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 not. It doesn't end up well usually. Uh, it just ends up in frustration. But I, th I think the point of the matter is there is ample scientific evidence to prove that the timing at which you give a message to people, you don't want to give people a message at eleven thirty right before they're breaking for lunch. They're hungry. They're not listening. They're not paying attention. You don't want to give it to them right after they come back from lunch. They're not paying attention. You don't want to give it to them at the, at the beginning of the day and the, the end of the day. The, the exercise, I, whenever I'm talking about this, that I always give to people is think about the decisions we make in security. How many people here make really great decisions about their about security at five o'clock on a Friday versus at two o'clock on a Tuesday? So I think that's 
to me, that's the most important thing when you're thinking about meeting the people where they are. And you, you also have to understand one of the things we don't do very well in security is speak the language of business. Um, we don't talk to our employees in the language that makes sense to them. I work for a fuel services company. Most of often that what I hear is we just deliver fuel. We get fuel, we put fuel in fuel tanks. Why do I need to care about data security? And then when you start to explain to them, well, do you collect customer data? What kind of customer data do you collect? Well, here's why what you're collecting is super important. Here's a regulation or a standard or a guideline, or just think about whether or not how you would feel if your data got out. We've all been at this point, if you've not, if you believe that your data has not been involved in a data breach, you are fooling yourself. Everyone has had their data exposed in a data breach. I was having a discussion with somebody yesterday. I was joking when I was in forensics. I, we used to, one of the first things we would do is you'd look up your own name and go, okay, cool. I'm either in there or I'm not. But eventually you start seeing names of people that you just that you know or you see yourself or you get one of the letters we've all experienced it so ashley my question for you really at this point is you know so we've we've heard a lot about and we we we've, we've talked about the fact that it's not really it's not really fair to put the onus on the employee and on the human what are the techniques that you've found to be most effective in helping the helping protect the employee without having to say to them you did something wrong you need to fix your behavior yeah great question uh, so i would say one comes back to thinking a lot about human-centered design and uh, ux design so when we're building out resources um, for employees to find information, whether it's how to report a security event or how to report a data security event or report phishing or really any of the behaviors that we're trying to make sure employees are doing is creating those systems with an understanding of human behavior. So for example, if a tool or a system is being built, make sure that there's a human risk or a security awareness perspective in building that project and in building that tool because those uh, people ultimately have the first-hand knowledge of <clears throat> how that system uh, is going to be used ultimately by users um, and how uh, how we can make it easier for them to find. If it takes two clicks to do something that's more insecure, how can we make it so that it's one step to do this secure element? So I would say that's one piece. Um, the second is making sure, to your point, Dustin, that we're communicating with people in an effective way. So using that emotional language, tying it back to making sure that it's relevant to their department. For example, you know, sharing a widespread cyber news story probably isn't going to get that much relevance. If it's a cyber news story that's specific to payroll, just send that out to payroll. The, the, while that may be important to the whole company, those people that are working in payroll are ultimately going to take it more heart to heart because that's what they're doing on a daily basis. And I would say the third is making sure that you're setting up lines of communications with your employees. A lot of the times I feel like with security teams, the security team is kind of acting in their own silo and they may be making decisions that aren't thinking about how employees are, are using systems, how they're working in their day to day. So it's really important to think about you know, who are the people that are going to be using these tools and systems? How do we get their buy-in, their insights? Make sure they feel like they're a part of the process because then it will you'll be more likely to ultimately have them on your side. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll I'll just interject real quickly and and Drew will get together afterwards and I'll get you my bank account number for the payment you're about to have to give me. But um don't be, I, I think we, we are hesitant at times to embrace technologies that are out there in organizations that are doing, helping us do this. And I think that's a misnomer and that's a, that's a real lost opportunity. We can't all create everything in-house anymore. It's not, that's not the way business works. You have to, you have to be willing to embrace technologies and companies and tools that are out there that can help you. I think we talked about it in the in, in the in the preparation for this. I should not care 
whether or not somebody clicks on a phishing email. Because regardless of whether they click on that email, I should have something in place, some control in place that makes clicking that email completely pointless if I don't want them to click on that, to go to that link. A phishing link should be innocuous no matter what. So if a user clicks a link that they weren't supposed to click, it should not matter to me because I've got a technology or I've got a control or I've got something in place that's protecting them. And then, then it becomes, we don't, you know, yeah, we would prefer if you didn't click the link, but if you make a mistake and you click the link, no big deal, just let us know. The example I think we talked about real quickly um, was, was Reddit. Reddit recently had an issue. User employee clicked a link, immediately reported it because they knew there was a system in place that was going to protect them and going to make it okay for them to have done that because they knew there was no harm because of the controls that were in place. And they knew that by reporting it, they were getting that word out. Yeah. Hey, so I'm going to jump in here, y'all. This has been a really great conversation. I have a, a couple of questions. I think the, the points you just made previously on providing context to this, you know, the group of end users that you're trying to inform of the proper security procedures is, is really important. Um, I, I learned that not super early in my cybersecurity career, but once I realized how to tie back messaging to their actual, what they care about in their job, which changes from vertical to vertical, from department to department to person to person, I, I was able to better reach them. Um, I, I also, you know, think about um, in, in the military, you know, the general is the one making the orders and, and pushing the orders downwards, but the soldiers at the bottom, they're following their sergeant into battle and trying to figure out how to leverage um, champions that are kind of leaders uh, of teams, uh, giving them the data that they can use to help assess who's risky, who's vigilant, and then some type of, of material that they can use to really tell their you know, group of uh, account payables, you know, this is why protecting uh, our company is important because if your computer is impacted by a breach or an incident or malware, this is what it means for our department versus this is what it means for the company. For large companies, it may be hard to get them to buy in, oh, we lose a couple thousand dollars for a multi-billion dollar company versus, oh, Jenny's gonna have to work 20 hours over the weekend to rectify this problem. So I really, really, you know, you know, keyed in onto that hyper-contextualization of this branding, communication, training, and awareness is gonna be really important to, to get buy-in. Um, we did have a question come in. Uh, this is a pretty, I like this question because it's like, we always think about how do we get the business to get on board with cyber, you know, good cyber, proper cyber hygiene. This question is, how do we enable an entry level cyber or IT person to ramp up their business language? Uh, how would you guys go about doing that at, at your businesses? You know, I think, I think one of the things that, that, and we actually just yesterday had a discussion about this in our in a, our uh it town hall which is send them out let them spend a day out with the business people let them literally shadow ride along, ride along. with somebody in the business i mean we see it talked about in you know police movies and what and tv and what have you but there's real value in it i've had some of the best experiences I've had in my career have been literally sitting with the people who do the work and watching them do it. Uh, the last company I worked at, large food distribution company, I literally spent a day just walking through the facility just to understand what they do and how they do it. First of all, it gave me a real appreciation for how many how many steps it takes to get a product I buy at store to the store, which as a consumer was just an eye-opening thing. But as a security professional, I could see what they're dealing with. I could see the challenges real life, and I could understand that. So send them out, send them out on a on a ride along with people. Yeah. Have them rotate around in other departments. It's I love that. It's such a, a powerful thing. Yeah, yeah I love that. A, I love the ride along. Ashley, do you mind sharing, yeah. your, sharing your thoughts on that as well? Yeah, um, that's a, a really great point. And that's what I was going to suggest as well as shadowing. But I would say shadow on both sides. 
So bring that person along for your experience as well, you know, kind of interchange back and forth. That will give you, I would say, the, the cyber practitioner an exposure to what that person's day-to-day -day looks like in their business. Maybe it will even give you a clue into some of the risks um, that, that you weren't aware of before or other exposures that might um, help in terms of trading and awareness. And then from the business perspective, just getting a clue into, um, you know, what are their crown jewels? What are they working on day-to-day? -day, um, and how does that intersect with cybersecurity? Um, what are the things that we can do to enable that person to do their job better and, and get their uh, their intake on it right on the spot? Yeah, I love that. Ashley and Dustin, I'm going to leave you with one last question. Uh, I'm going to ask the same one that I asked Chris Roberts. Which sci-fi movie should we as, uh, aspire to be like? Which one is like, this is what I think humanity needs to turn into if we have a chance, if we want to have a chance on this world? Ooh, that's tough. Man, that's, that's a really tough way. one. Most of I was just going to say, one. I already had one for the other way. Yeah, I mean, I've always said if I saw Arnold Schwarzenegger coming down the street, I'm gone, I'm out. But that doesn't work for your question. So, um, you know, I, th I think I would say, I'll say the end of Wally, -E, actually. I'm going to take the end of Wally. -E, when they finally realized that this was a bit ridiculous, I, I think when we understand and when we acknowledge that we've got things that we didn't intend to do we didn't intend you know in all my in all my doctoral research the biggest thing i've tried i've tried to communicate about cognitive biases it's not a bad thing we have it for a reason i have a bias towards not touching hot things because i know i'm going to get burned that's a good thing to have um, you know, not putting myself in in harm's way. So I think I would say the end of Wally, where when they, when when we realize, you know what, this is not the way to live. Absolutely. That's a really good one. And mine, um, I would say, is is a little less sci-fi, but bicentennial man. Um, I would say that's a good one because you Robin know, Williams. We're on the, yeah, we're Robin Williams, and we're right on the you know the cusp of AI technology, and I think. There's a lot of, and Dustin and I talked about this, a lot of positivity that can come from, um, you know, AI and even just in terms of what we can do with security awareness. But I think we have to, we have to understand it from many different perspectives and, and really incorporate it in the right way for your business and not just kind of take a tool at base value and say, hey, we're going to start using this. Really think about how that aligns with your business objectives. Yeah, I love that. Was it the last scene of Bicentennial Man, Robin Williams, just kind of walking down the street and like over to the beaches and stuff? Was yeah. that was that the ending, if I can remember? Yeah, I mean, yeah. in the click as well, you could also go with for Madam Sandler. I mean, yes. he realizes yes. that he just needs to slow down on life. I mean, yeah. I think there's that as bad as all these movies are, the end of them typically have that like, let's take a step back and yeah, understand. I hope we get that chance. Ashley and, and uh, Dustin, this has been a great conversation. Um, as we head into our third break, let's hear from one of uh, one of the leading human risk management professionals and staff here at Living Security and her invitation to join the Living Security community. Jenny, the floor is yours. everyone. We recorded the video you just saw two years ago, and today we're celebrating the community's second anniversary. I'm Jenny Kinney. I am part of Living Security's client success team and the head facilitator of the community. We started with about 50 core members two years ago, and we're now approaching a thousand.
I work with a team of ambassadors from around the world to create content, generate ideas, and keep everything running smoothly. It has been incredibly rewarding to watch the community grow. Today, some of our most popular conversations are around generative AI, phishing simulations programs, policies, and communications. It's basically a safe place to come and share your struggles, your wins, and questions about how to better manage human risk. Before I became a living security employee, I was actually a client and a security awareness manager. So everything we do comes from a place of personal experience and empathy for your role. If you're not already a member, I invite you to join us by answering yes to the community poll. And if you are a member, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your engagement. And we'll see you soon. Jenny, Jenny Kinney is the best. If you are not part of the community, um, I'm not saying it's a competition every year, how many people we get to sign up, but it might be a competition. Uh, so go sign up now. Uh, we're over a thousand people, a, a lot of really good engagement, like Jenny mentioned, head over there soon. Uh, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, someone who knows how to inspire others to champion cybersecurity within their organization. Catherine Glenn, currently serving as the Senior Information Security Awareness and Training Lead at Kimberly Clark, has not once, but twice created dynamic 25 person ambassador programs on zero budget, utilizing the passion and skills of her fellow team members. Catherine brings together her expertise in marketing and information technology, fortified by her master's degree in marketing to create synergy in the cybersecurity space. Her mission over the past seven years in InfoSec has been to empower employees not to fear cyber threats, but to stand strong against them. Uh, in her view, people aren't the problem, but indeed the solution to security challenges. Uh, I know in 2023, with budgets uh, being on the hot seat, uh, this program is going to have all the ears uh, listening up. And I know there's going to be some very extremely tactical, tactical takeaways. Uh, as always, let's keep the, um, the, the chat going with any questions, and we'll have five to 10 minutes after her presentation to, to get through them. Please join me in warmly welcoming uh, Catherine Glenn. Catherine, the floor is all yours. All right. Thank you, Drew. Yes. Hello, and thank you. I am Catherine Glenn, and I am the Senior Lead for Cybersecurity Awareness at Kimberly Clark. Um, that's right. I'm going to show you how to create a leadership-approved ambassador program for zero dollars. Oh, excuse me, my slides just jumped. All right, back on. All right, what qualifies me to give you this presentation? Drew kind of gave a little bit of a background of myself. I have been in awareness for over eight years and I have started two ambassador programs for two exceptional companies. The first one being Oshkosh Corporation and my current one being Kimberly Clark. Um, Oshkosh Corporation makes vehicles for our military, firefighters, um, waste management, and many more. And Kimberly Clark, I'm sure you all have used at least one of our products, whether it was a Kleenex tissue, a Huggies diaper, or our Cottonelle toilet paper. So two extremely different companies, but nonetheless, both of them needed cybersecurity ambassador programs, and that is where I came in. I have heard every single one of these statements multiple times in various different forms um, from awareness professionals. And I myself have even stated some of these um, on reasons why I cannot start an ambassador program at this time. 
I want to tell you that unless you are at your first year of your development for your awareness program, you need to have an ambassador program and you should do it. If you continue to avoid creating your uh, ambassador program, your awareness program will suffer for it. So if you think that you don't have enough time now, I got to tell you, you're not going to get any slower. We're all just getting busier and there is no one magically coming um, to take something off our plate. I wish that was happening, but it's just not. If your goal is to have an ambassador program next year, it probably was your goal last year and it'll probably be your goal the year before. And just think if you had started it this year, how much further along your ambassador program would be. The I need more team members to start um, before I can actually start this program, that's not true. And I'm gonna go into detail on why you don't need any more team members than just yourself to get an ambassador program going. And then that final one, the leadership would never approve of my program. So when awareness professionals ask me or tell me that, that their leadership would never approve, I always say, did you actually ask them, you know, were you in the right crowd? Did you give them the right details? when you went about asking that question. So all of these things could be holding you back from creating your ambassador program, but they don't need to be. You just need to start and I'm gonna help you do that. So how do you start? A little bit of research and development, of course. Um, you do not have to invest in this amazing new process or get the latest and greatest new platform I'm not sure if they even have ambassador platforms, but you don't have to do that. You need to leverage what you already have and what you're already paying for. So many of us are on this call because we already work with Living Security. They're a partner, right? Go to them, ask them, do they have something for you um, that, they, that you could use to develop your ambassador program? Maybe they have a presentation similar to mine that they would send you and say, hey, watch this and get some bits and pieces from it. I started uh, my program by creating a full presentation deck that I would be able to have ready and send to anybody who would have a question regarding my ambassador program that I was creating. And I highly encourage you all to start there as well. So I could visualize what I wanted. Um, I knew how many team members I wanted it to be. I knew what locations I wanted them to be at. I knew what tasks I wanted them to give, but I needed to write it down so that others could conceptualize and digest what I was talking about and that they would be able to have a reference to go back to um, when they were trying to decide if the program would be beneficial or not. And I'm going to explain to you throughout this presentation what else I put into that full presentation deck that I'm talking about. All right, the absolute first thing you have to do is determine your name. This is super obvious, I know, but hear me out. You need to consider your company culture. And you also need to figure out if there are other groups out there holding a name that could be similar to yours. So champion is something um, that is very common, right? Um, there may be champions of HR, champions of finance. You want your group to stand out above the rest. You do not want them to blend in. So if there are other groups out there that have champion, maybe you want your group to be cyber heroes, or maybe you want them to be the traditional ambassador name. Maybe your company has a name that you could do play on words with, um, and that could help you develop the name. Be creative with it. You know, we're all in marketing here. Um, so develop the name first and then go from there and promote it out. All right, at this point in my presentation, um, you have yourself a name for the volunteers. You are starting your presentation deck or you're starting to think about it. And all of this has been done so far for zero dollars. I have asked for zero additional funding to my manager. The only thing that really has been lost is a bit of my time. Within that deck that you're creating, you need to explain your why. 
This is huge, and it does not have to be super complex. This is the exact um, slide that I gave my manager as to why I thought Kimberly Clark needed an ambassador program. Super simple, right? So the first bullet, to increase information security awareness team without taking on an additional headcount. The second one, to increase awareness engagement. Kimberly Clark has many different demographics and regions, and ambassadors could help bridge this gap and create a more customized feel for our users. Very simple, but very impactful. After you determine your why and really start to lay out this program um, deck that we've talked about, you need to figure out how you're going to get your ambassadors, right? We all have team members who are not on the cybersecurity team, but they seem to have a passion for it. Maybe they're liking everything that you do. Maybe they're reaching out to you. Maybe they're providing feedback, or maybe they're even giving you some time already here and there. These are the people that you want to start with. These could be your pilot for your ambassador program. These are my examples. So this is Dennis Jubin and Anne Marie. These three team members, along with others, um, were my ambassadors before I was even hired at Kimberly Clark. They were doing the ambassador job. Um, and when I did get hired, I was told to go to them with any questions that I had, go to them with regional questions, go to them if I want um, to see an increase in my training numbers, go to them if I want to send out an email and have people actually read it. Okay, so we're all in awareness here. You understand how tricky it can be to get communications out. Sometimes you have to leverage these people in different regions, and that's exactly what this group did for me. These people were not even on the cybersecurity team, and they were making a huge impact because they already had status and they had built relationships in their regions and their locations, and they were willing to let me use them um, to leverage my data. Anne-Marie on the end, if Anne-Marie sends out an email, you best bet every single person in France is reading that email. That's the kind of power that she has, and she was willing to help me spread my message. And I thank her for that because it was a complete security gap there. And without Anne-Marie, we could be you know, at a different situation for that region. So think about your own company and who you could leverage. Find these people, they're out there. They're really not trying to hide. They're the ones that are you know, reaching out to you and that they want more info and they wanna help you. And then if you ask them to become an ambassador, they're likely going to say yes because they're already doing the job and now you're offering them recognition for it. So again, this is who you want to start with for your pilot or so um, ambassador program. But what about the others, right? You want to have more than just three or four people. So in your deck, you need to plan um, how you should determine how many ambassadors you're going to have and how you're going to have them join. So are you going to do like one person from each location? Are you going to do one person per region? Or are you going to allow it to be anybody who wants to volunteer is welcome to be an ambassador? That's totally up to you. It depends on what you think you can take on. Um, I have heard of awareness professionals uh, reach out to all admins in their company in the hopes to leverage them as ambassadors. This is a great creative idea. Um, so think about it. You know, there might be an audience out there that you could leverage, and that would be super simple uh, to just turn them into ambassadors and help you out. When advertising to volunteers, use what your company has to offer that is free. At Kimberly Clark, we have things that are called gigs. So a gig is something where you can go and sign up and be part of a project outside of your own department. So this is perfect for ambassadors, right? They can just go and sign up and then I get notified that they wanna be part of my gig or my ambassador program. Many of us being in awareness, we have a newsletter or some sort of form of communication that goes out write an article in your newsletter asking for volunteers to be ambassadors. Uh, if your company has some sort of social media, such as Yammer, 
take a poll, see who would be interested or who wants to learn more about this program. Cybersecurity is such a hot topic. Um, and I have had many volunteers come to me um, that are super techie and some that aren't at all. And then I've even had some people come and ask and ask to be an ambassador and they confess later on that they only wanted to do this because they wanted to stay up to date with cybersecurity um, in order to protect their family. And I believe that all different tech levels are very important for you to have a successful ambassador program so that you can see all different avenues um, of you know, the tech world and what people are thinking and concerned about throughout your company. So all these all of these items that I have just mentioned are free to me. And I encourage you to go and look at your own company and see what you could use um, that is also free for you. Before an ambassador will commit to your program, they will likely want to know um, these three things. So what are the expectations? What activities are you going to have them do? And then of course, what's in it for them? They might not commit to becoming an ambassador until they know all of these things. So you need to have these examples ready. Uh, you can see on my screen, this is just an example. I'm sure yours would look a bit different but I was asking uh, my ambassadors for two hours a month of their time in order to be an ambassador, along with a couple other different items. And then I was also asking them to hold this position for a minimum of two years. Whatever your expectations are for your ambassadors, they need to be obtainable for someone who is already doing a full-time job, right? So they don't have that much time they don't have 10 hours to give you a month but maybe two is just about reasonable the activities that i have here this is more so of like a what would a day in the life of an ambassador look like um, and these are just examples of what i would ask my ambassadors to do yours will definitely look different but you get the idea of what i'm trying to um, go for here Similar to the expectations, these activities are things that will be very important for your new ambassadors to know in order to get them to commit to volunteering to your program. And then what's in it for the ambassador? This is the most important part and the part that your ambassador will definitely care the most about. And recognition is very powerful. Um, I encourage you that to have your CISO or your CIO send a letter to your new ambassador's uh, manager, uh, thanking them for being part of your ambassador program and for protecting your company's data. So again, these three slides that I just showed you very quickly are definitely geared towards the expectations of your ambassador, but they're also something that would be great for you to go more in depth with um, and even answer questions on your first uh, meeting with all of your ambassadors once you have them volunteered. All right, so at this point, um, you have a name, you've started your presentation deck, you've narrowed down the ambassador group that you're going for, and you've given your ambassadors your expectations of what they're going to have to do. So I'm giving you another price check. I have done all of this for zero dollars. Yes, again, I have given up my time, but I have asked my manager for zero additional funding. So now I'm at the moment of truth the true item that could make or break your ambassador program but it needs to be done you have to get that leadership buy-in you need your program's message to come from the top down as well as from the bottom up if you remember in my first couple slides that fourth bullet point um, it said that um, leadership would never approve of my program you have to make sure that you have the right knowledge and details to make sure that they do approve of your program. You have to give them that information. They need to at least understand what your program's goal is, know the name of your program, and be able to acknowledge 
um, your group should another executive ask them about it. You do not want to catch them off guard. So what if you still can't get this leadership buy-in? Um, recently, a team member from Kimberly Clark was retiring um, and he wrote a few different Yammer posts to the whole company explaining how um, he made it to retirement, right? And he said that the book Orbiting the Giant Hairball um, by Gordon McKenzie changed his life. And after reading it, he had a new outlook um, at work. And I thought, wow, if somebody could write that as a statement, you know, that this book changed his life, I thought it would be something worth reading. And I got this quote um, from it, and it made me really think about the ambassador program and the speech that I was giving today um, and not allowing a leader to say no, right? So it says over there, um, anytime a bureaucrat, a custodian of the system, stands between you and something you need or want, your challenge is to help that bureaucrat discover a means harmonious with the system to meet your needs, right? So make them understand, make them see the value. Don't let them say no. Help them see how this could fit with your company and how it can benefit your organization. Another thing for your leadership, I highly encourage you to create an elevator pitch. In case you ever find yourself in a situation like I was talking to leaders trying to explain my program. So we've all heard of an elevator pitch, right? Um, you're stuck in an elevator with somebody probably higher up and you're trying to sell them your product, sell them what you want done. Um, and this is exactly what I want you to create. So recently um, at Kimberly Clark, I was in a meeting and I was put on the on the spot and asked to talk about this ambassador program that I was creating. My CISO was on the call. Um, this was a video call, right? So everyone could see me. My CISO was on the call and so was my entire IT team. And I was asked to, to tell him what this was going to be about. So I gave him my pitch in front of my entire team and I waited for his response. And this is exactly what I said to him. I said, I'm going to add 25 team members onto your cybersecurity awareness team for $0. Do you support that? His response, his name is Jim, his response, yes, done. And then he, you know, of course, chuckled a little bit. He said, this is a no brainer. Um, now I gave that pitch fully confident because I had already completed my deck that I'm asking you to complete here. Um, and I actually had that whole PowerPoint ready to give him. I had a one pager in case he just wanted a little bit of the details. So yes, I went into my elevator pitch very confident. But the thing is, is when you when you talk to somebody that high up, such as my CISO, those details aren't necessarily what he's looking for. What Jim heard from me was that I was going to add um, more team members, more awareness team members, and I was going to do it for zero dollars. So his departmental or his department cost did not change at all. And our team was going to be improving. How can you really say no to that? So, again. Um, I encourage you to create this elevator pitch so that you can have that top-down support and make sure that your message is heard. Um, your CISO or your, CI or your CIO understanding your program and maybe even sending out a letter on your behalf um, stating that you're having an ambassador program could make all of the difference for the success in your um, awareness ambassador program. Now, once you have that leadership buy-in, Leaders do not forget <laughs> what you have discussed with them. Eventually, they're going to come back to you and they're going to say, hey, how's your program doing? And at that point, you need to have these statistics ready. Um, leaders will ask you, how is it making an impact to our company and is it making a difference? And these are some items that you could start tracking right away, but I'm sure based on your program, they might look a little bit different than what I have. Okay, so another price check. All of this that I discussed with you today can be done for a grand total of $0. Yes, it will take a little bit of your time, but I think in the end that we will all see that it is worth it 
and that getting your message spread across and having that additional um, headcount and those additional people that you can go and leverage your ambassadors or go and leverage your ambassadors and leverage to have your communications for your awareness program, um, that is that is priceless compared to the time that you had to put in. So please take what I did today, customize it, um, and make it fit to your company and your organization and just get started on creating your ambassador program. I'm happy to take any questions that you have now or um, if you have some later, please reach out to me. Thank you, Catherine, for that wonderful presentation. Like, like I mentioned, it was super tangible. Um, Rebrand this deck and, and you should be able to pitch your boss on setting up your first uh, your first ambassador program. Um, I do have a couple questions for you, and I think we have some time. Mm -hmm. um, what was your biggest mistake? Uh, you've, you've done this twice. Tell us about a time where you're like, man, I wish I got that one back, uh, whether from a strategic planning approach or maybe a technical implementation, maybe you got on the elevator and you forgot your pitch. I don't know. Uh, tell us about a time you made a mistake and, and maybe how we can learn from it. Yes. So, at my my first time setting it up, uh, my biggest mistake was that I wasn't fully prepared for um, how much energy my ambassadors were going to have, and they constantly wanted materials, and I wasn't ready for them at that point. So uh, I made sure later on that I had um, like a website developed for them so that they could just go and grab it themselves, and that they could customize things themselves. So that was maybe my biggest mistake, but it's a good thing to have, right? Like they want, they had a, such an appetite for it that I just couldn't keep up. Yeah, that's helpful. I'm just, just preparing for, for more than you expect. Um, I had some ideas I actually wanted to throw your way. I was, I wonder like, what about, um, I was thinking, you know, when you first started running the program, starting, you know, kind of doing a guerrilla marketing effort, or even just a very tactical, like, I'm not going to go wide. I'm going to find some of the, you know, you had three individuals, right, that you had on your program. I think some other ideas, and I, maybe you can help um, help the audience find some interesting ideas to highlight these initial members of the team. Who were the top 10 people at reporting phishing emails? Like who mm -hmm. <clears throat> always report them, who never gets called? Like those are the people that I want on my ambassador. I want the people that I'm already seeing positive vigilant behavior. Maybe we start, hey, listen, because you are so good at identifying malicious emails and you report them and you do exactly what you want, you are the ideal candidate for this ambassador program kickoff. Uh, I'd love for you to join. Do you have any other ideas of, of, of how we can kind of find those initial few members before we go out to the masses? Yeah, so I, I think I kind of mentioned like having that creativity behind it and like how somebody said they, they specifically just did their admins. Um, but if you have like those social media, like internal social medias, the people that are constantly commenting and liking your things, those are probably the ones that you do want to focus on a little bit more because they are the ones that kind of have that radar for cybersecurity or at least that interest. Um, so maybe they didn't necessarily have the top score for their phishing or even their training, but they're trying to do better. So. It depends on their appetite, right? But there's different ways that you can go about finding those people. Um, and if you just look a little bit, I think that you'd see, you know, like they're they're just they're not hiding. They're trying to come out and they're trying to ask you questions and be part of it. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Have you thought about like a multi-level marketing program where like your initial ambassadors like have to recruit more ambassadors and then they have to recruit more report uh, recruit more ambassadors? Have you thought through that as an idea for for increasing your uh, your scale here? Mm -hmm. So actually, at Oshkosh Corporation, I ended up with over a hundred ambassadors, um, and th they're not the the largest company, but that is what it what happened. So I had twenty five, and then it was almost like this was so cool that we needed more. You know, more people were talking about it. People wanted to join. They were like, oh, you know, she gave out. Um, and you don't have to give out swag, but she gave me this cool ambassador plaque that says I'm the ambassador for Oshkosh Corporation. I want that. I want people to come and ask me questions. Um, so eventually the word just kind of got out and I ended up having over 100 and there were layers, right? So 
um, there was my initial ambassador for that location and then maybe there would be a sub ambassador for it and then maybe they wanted their intern on it so then there was another one and um, you know the more the merrier is how I always thought of it and you know they they did their own leveling they kind of did their own work right so the ambassador would take certain activities and then the top um or i'm sorry the intern would take certain activities and then the the top original ambassador would maybe take like the more serious items if it was like a full-on email that i was requesting yeah no i love that i love that um another idea i'm like full of ideas cyber executive of the month you were talking about like how do we get these executives buy-in like what if you had this like special, you know, they are the cyber ambassador executive of the month and you strategically pick, you know, maybe people that are a little bit hard to like get in their office and you like bestow this honor on them. Say, hey, you, I want you to be our cybersecurity. Like here's, it's a program. It's like a lunch and learn. It's gonna take two hours. I'm gonna do all of the work, but it's gonna help your team realize how important cybersecurity is. And it's good out. I want you to be an advocate for them joining our ambassador program because of X, Y, and Z. What, what are your thoughts there? I love it. Yes, I say go for it. Um, I didn't have exactly that sort of um, item on my program, but I love the idea of it. Um, OK, I just had a quick question came in. So what tools have you used to measure the uh, efficacy of an overall program? Yeah, so it depends what your goal is for the program, right, and how your company would perceive the value for it. So I've used different items like how many ambassadors I've had. Um, and then versus how many people are at their location that they're trying to reach. And then you can see like if they did some sort of um, like game or escape room, like how many people joined. Um, and then you can even go and you can um, see how they performed afterwards, right? And so performance could be anything from their click rate, um, their reporting rate in the end, um, and, and that can be done probably on whichever platform you use for your phishing. Um, but there are different ways that you can do this. Um, and my team has an exceptional reporting group. Um, they're our ODS team, and they're able to kind of help me, man like not manipulate the data, but gather the data um, a little bit better than me just putting something, um, you know, into Excel. They can really like visualize what I'm going for and help me sell that. So partnering with your own team um, is huge in order to get your, your message across. Have you used any generative AI resources yet in, in helping you to manage resources or training or, or invitations to your ambassador program? Yeah, I think we've all been curious about it, right? So creating things, you know, you could even go out there and say, like, how would you, you know, create an ambassador program for me? And it probably would split out the best items um, that they think for you, but it wouldn't be tailored to your organization. So I have used items or looked at items for like marketing materials wise and verbiage, but uh, you know, it, it only goes so far and then you have to kind of put your own human element on it and actually customize it for your company. So a little bit, but not too much, I guess. Cool. Uh, this was a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to keep it, keep track on the, on the chat over here. There's so much going on. Uh, I definitely recommend jumping back into the webinar and, and maybe being able to answer any questions that I wasn't able to get to here. Last question of the day, sci-fi movie we should aspire to in, in the coming years or, or which one is, is you think would be like this? I can live with this versus like <laughs> this scares the crap out of me. What's, what's your thoughts there? Um, I'm not sure if you should aspire to be part of the matrix, but it would be pretty cool, right? Um, and then for the second portion that you said that kind of scares the crap out of you, I'm not sure, and I don't even think this movie has launched, but I've seen a, a commercial for that that Megan, which is like a full like AI childhood doll. Um, that kind of creeps me out. I hope that that never comes for us uh, in the future. Yeah, no, those are great. Um, yeah, I mean, Matrix would be more of a revelation than an innovation, yeah. right? Like, oh, wow, we're here. This is... We've been here the whole time. Uh, Megan, I think, did come out. I think at least my oldest daughter saw it and said it was did pretty, I didn't. pretty darn creepy. Yeah, it looks um, super creepy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it looks like I think the thing about Megan is like five years ago, we'd be like, there's no way like this is, you know, flying cars, you know, but like I, I can see this being next year, you know, with with all the the generative AI, the the advanced robotics and, and being able to kind of blend the two together. So 
Um, Catherine, thank you so much for joining me today and preparing for this uh, conversation. I know it, it took some time out of your day, but like we have hundreds of people in this conference right now that uh, hopefully can you know kickstart an ambassador program that maybe they weren't able to uh, before. So I think you're you know your the results are going to be felt uh, within the community. Um, yeah. Thank so you for having me, Drew. Absolutely. Um, enjoy some more of Living Security's short form content and some much needed insights from our esteemed guests of the conferences. We're going to be returning uh, with our second to last uh, session uh, with Rinky Sethi uh, from Revolutionary to Routine, Building a Business Case for Cybersecurity Innovation. Uh, I will see you guys back in a couple minutes. I've got a story time for everybody today. So I've been getting a ton of spam in my email. And so I plugged in my email address into one of those websites, you know, that tells you if you've had a data breach. Have you tried it? I was shocked. My email address and my password that I use for pretty much everything had been compromised several times. And I didn't even know it. Turns out whenever you have a password breach, it gets sold on the dark web. And so because I use the same password over and over again, basically all of my accounts were at risk. I knew that you were supposed to use like a unique password for all of your accounts, but I didn't necessarily know why. And so now I have to go back and rechange all of those passwords for all of those accounts. It's gonna take me forever. I might as well just start now, right? <laughs> okay, I'll talk to you later, bye. Hey y'all. So I had the worst day ever. I spent the whole afternoon with IT because I fell for a phishing email, clicked a bad link and got malware on my laptop. Computer's fixed, but we had to restore from an old backup, so I lost a ton of work on that big project that's due at the end of the month, and now I'm super behind. The worst part of it is, when we were looking over the email, we could totally tell it was a fish. I was just going really fast and not paying attention. Good reminder to slow down and really scrutinize all the links before clicking them. Anyways, Hope you're having a good day and I'll see you later. Hey guys, so I had the worst day ever. I spent the whole afternoon with IT because I fell for a phishing email, clicked a bad link and got malware on my laptop. Computer's fixed, but we had to restore from an old backup. So I lost a ton of work on that big project that's due at the end of the month. And now I'm super behind. The worst part of it is when we were looking over the email, we could totally tell it was a fish. I was just going really fast and not paying attention. Good reminder to slow down and really scrutinize all the links before clicking them. Anyways, hope you're having a good day and I'll see you later. Increasingly seeing organizations recognize that the fancy or expensive tooling is not the one-stop security solution that they thought it would be. We're acknowledging kind of the elephant in the room that we've always talked about, which is that humans, intentionally or unintentionally, are the primary cause of a lot of incidents. But what we're seeing now is people realizing that the data really only tells you so much. Leadership has been asking for us uh, to come forward and to share our knowledge, and I'm so happy to be part of that. What I love about the maturing of human risk management is we're finally focused on the individuals that are actually doing the job. It's been really exciting to see a pivot away from the traditional detect and respond, and more thinking along the lines of prevention. And that really is the goal of Human risk management is to focus on individuals. Driving not only that awareness that people have, but driving into behavior change that happens. And by protecting the individuals and making them feel protected, they ultimately protect our organization.
All right, I am thrilled to introduce our esteemed panelists for today's fireside chat titled From Revolutionary to Routine, Building a Business Case for Cybersecurity Innovation. Um, this topic is a little self-serving for living security. I'm gonna be very upfront with you today. Uh, we developed uh, a human response notification platform just a couple of years ago, and it's been brand new to the market. Uh, and some of the problems that we find is how do our human risk managers sell this up, get buy-in from not only the CISO, but from the greater investment committee of their, uh, of their leadership. And so this conversation is going to be really about how can we build a value-driven use case, get buy-in and budget, especially in 2023, uh, for programs that we know are going to have some of the greatest change in terms of risk reduction that we've ever seen. First, we have Rinky Sethi, the CISO at Bill.com. With her unparalleled leadership expertise in technology and security, Rinky has spearheaded efforts to secure the digital footprints of major Fortune 500 companies like Twitter, IBM, and Walmart. Currently, she leads Bill.com's global IT functions and is actively involved in advising the company's continuous innovations in the security domain. Beside her executive role, Rinky also serves on the boards of Fordrock and Valtteri and advises multiple startups and VCs. Alongside Rinky, we have Marjin Veribre, lead partner for cybersecurity at KPMG Australia. He is coming in live, so uh, as long as uh, the internet connection is good, I know he's going to be uh, up and lively with us today. Uh, with a rich career spanning over 20 years, Marjin has led major uh, cyber and technology risk transformations globally, specializing in cyber risk strategy and implementation for the C-suite. Having established a European business for an Australian tech startup, he brings a unique perspective to cybersecurity solutions. Prior to his role at KPMG, Marjin led the cybersecurity business for KPMG's largest corporate clients in their London office. Together, Rinky and Marjin will share their insights on how they navigated the complexities of cybersecurity sales and successfully convince CISOs to adopt new technology and innovative solutions. Let's give a warm welcome to our panelists, Rinky and Marjin. So could, let, let's just dive right into it. Um, and thank you for being here. Could, could you both discuss a time when you were first introduced to an innovative concept, maybe like something like endpoint detection and response or two-factor authentication? How were these technologies initially pitched and what made their value propositions effective? Rinky, do you want to kick us off on today's conversation? Yeah, I, I'll be honest, I can't remember the workplace without two-factor auth, so I'll talk a little bit about <laughs> endpoint detection. Um, and so I remember when this notion of endpoint prevention, and in fact, I worked at a company that de, uh, built an endpoint detection tool, and it was a shift in mindset, right, that you're no longer building kind of virus protection or endpoint protection software, prevention software, but how do you rely more on detection? And it was, um, there was, you know, a lot of skepticism in the market around, no, you need to have both. You need to have prevention and detection and to have to prove and do side by side comparisons on, no, this is a new way of doing endpoint, um, you know, protection is using detection. And so um, I remember uh, that being kind of a new way of doing things. The company I worked for that was building it, we didn't believe in it as a security team ourselves. Um, and so it took a long time for us to actually adopt and drink our own champagne um, and, and prove that this was truly a, a new way of doing things. Yeah, Marjan, what about you? Yeah, it's, it's really funny to hear this, uh, Rinky. And I think I, I'm going to go back all the way to the start of my career when uh, I was doing a lot of public key infrastructure uh, work, uh, PKI for the nerds here, certifications and so on. And and this, this is all about authentication, non-repudiation, digital signatures and so on. And, and we were so tech focused at the time and it was a great great technology, great for the nerds in us. And But then when you think about it, 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 it required things like smart card. At, at that time, you couldn't stick into anything. Um, and there were no applications that could actually use it. Uh, the, the ecosystem was so far behind, or maybe we were so far ahead, but we made a lot of, um, a lot of uh, work of, of, of developing business cases for governments, large banks, big payment infrastructures, and so on. Uh, but we were absolutely overemphasizing the technology features of it rather than the actual applicability, the, the, the actual use cases. Um, at the end of the day, this stuff, when it kicks in, it becomes invisible for the users. And uh, we were absolutely too nerdy at the time uh, trying to pitch the technology features of it. So that was a big lesson learned over time. But it took us a few years before we realized that, to be frank. Yeah, so Ricky, I think your story is really is very interesting because, you know, here you are, you know, your livelihood at this company that this company is like the success of this product. And even internally, you had um, it sounds like some difficulty uh, with that value proposition. So maybe like 
like, was this something that was spearheaded by was just the rest of the business? Like, no, we have to do this no matter what, or, or like, what did it take internally for the team to collectively come together and say, actually, I think this is the right move for us. I think this innovation is going to be a big value to our, to our company. There were a couple of things that happened, right? Again, because this was, there was, this was new innovation. It was a shift in mindset that was happening. And then internally, like you want to, of course, when you're working for a company like this, you want to be able to adopt the product, but it has to do and meet the requirements from a security perspective. And I think it was, um a year after i joined before we adopted the the product the company was building before that there was a gap kind of in certain areas and certain features the product needed to have and so we were testing side by side for a year right and it finally at that one year mark it had all the features all the capabilities that we felt it needed and and finally we saw a shift in our own mindsets that wow this is actually a, a better way to protect uh, endpoints. And so it took a mindset shift of the security organization ourselves, but it also, the product needed some uh, capabilities that were missing. And so we did that POC uh, for almost a year and then finally, you know, proved itself. And, um, and then kind of the whole team's mindset changed after that on this new innovation, this new way of thinking about things. Yeah, that makes yeah, that makes sense. Um, Marjan, so when you think about other skepticism when you're pitching, you know, products to global organizations, maybe it, to fill a, a hole in it, maybe it's something new. Like, how do you how do you approach that? Like, what is your strategy for getting that buy in? Kind of knowing from a innovation perspective, like, no, this is we need to go here because I know you're in in, in two years you're going to reflect back and be like, this was the best move we've made in a decade. But in that initial period where resistance to change, resistance to divert budget or funds um, and getting buy in from non technical people, even like how do you how do you strategize that type of conversation? Yeah, I mean, it depends a bit on the organization that you're in. But I think what Ricky said, like if you can do a POC quick early upon and to really demonstrate all the features and the benefits, that's the way to go. Um, it doesn't always happen in a lot of organizations, though, that not everyone's that agile and that's that, that's straightforward. So often you end up in business cases, uh, paper based governance and so on. And sadly, that is still often how the world works. Uh, and then when you, when you do this in smaller cases, obviously, the first thing you want to pitch is, I guess, a, a POC. Uh, what are the benefits and so on? And with, with, with the stuff that we do around security, it's, 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 it's not always as straightforward to build a business case. But, but typically, there is something like something you do a bit more. You can do something a bit more effective. So that's sort of the first angle. Whatever it is you do, it's going to be more effective. The second aspect is it can be more efficient. So there's some cost savings involved as well, which is sometimes hard for security, but often you don't do anything. And therefore, by doing something, it's going to it's going to cost you something. And then the third one is the, is the risk angle, like what risk does it actually reduce? And uh, and this is the bit where we probably made the most progress over the last years, whereby we are starting to really quantify the risk reduction or, or the risk uplift you get from something like this. Uh, it used to be three by three matrixes, uh, um, high, medium, low risk reduction, and and that's now being moved to much more yeah quantifying actually what what is it that we're trying to protect ourselves from, uh, and how does it move the needle, and uh, especially how do you do it by automating some of these things. So yeah, I see a real shift from paper-based business cases, POCs, uh, to, to, to proper risk quantification. But if you can do a POC and you've got a great product, that's the way to go, 100%. Yeah, if I, if I can add a piece too to what Marjean said, um, was is that, uh, you know, with uh, skepticism is actually a really good thing. <laughs> and I think that when people are skeptic um, and then you get to go and really influence them and change their minds, they become champions generally. Um, yeah. And many times, you know, we as security practitioners see incidents all the time. We see a ton of data bringing those incidents and kind of proving how a certain technology, how a certain innovation is going to help and actually showing them that this is an actual issue that needs to be dealt with. And, you know, it's it's those folks, I think, that are really important, actually, in changing cultures in the com in companies. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And I think like you know, to call out three fundamental things. If you are in this audience and you, you are looking to innovate here, how, can you be more effective with this investment? Can you be more efficient with this investment? Can you actually reduce risk? And, I, and I'd love to focus on that third one because I think where we are at in this stage of human risk management, it's like, 
up until a year or two ago, most CISOs, most organizations, most cybersecurity professionals would say you can't measure the reduction of, of, of human risk. And, and I think what we focus on at Living Security and some other organizations are doing is like, you can, you just have to think that number one, human behavior can change with some type of intervention. Um, and that difference in, you know, that moving from risky human behaviors to vigilant human, be human behaviors actually reduces the risk for the company. And so getting a little bit more specific to this audience, it's like, you know, how do we, how do we make that case, right? Specifically in, in human risk management, how can we make the case that we're not just box checkers with annual training and that we can be effective, we can be more efficient and we can reduce risk. What do you, what do you all solve there? Uh, whoever wants to take it first, go for it. Rinky, you go ahead. All right. Well, so I think what, when you're talking about risk, it's important to build a storyline. It's, it's so important to first have visibility and around the risks that you have. And if you can showcase that here's some of the human related risks, or here's some of the technology or process related risks, and here's how we're tracking that, then every investment you make should hopefully, you know, if you're taking a risk based, based approach should show reduction in those risks. Um, and then you should see a decrease in number of incidents related to that risk area. And I think it's really important to build that storyline, right? That how are you showing this are the types of risks? This is what's led to incidents that actually can be avoided if we deploy a certain technology or we deploy a certain solution. And the same goes for the human side of risk, right? There's a lot of metrics you can show as to how people are posing risk to the organization, either because we need better tools or we need better training or we need whatever it is and then showing how the investments in those areas are reducing risk over time i think is a, is a, a critical storyline and it's not just important for executives and the technology you're trying to deploy but more and more now boards and like the executive team is looking at these types of metrics and asking that you know the same things aren't working what are you doing differently how are you tracking these things so i think it's more important than ever Hundred percent, Rinky. I fully agree with that. And, and I think when when we do sort of risk quantification work, so, so we're moving away from cyber maturity and compliance to much more like actually, what is the what is the actual risk and what's the risk buy down of these these controls that we put in. And human risk management is one of those controls, but it's one of the, the strongest ones. What we typically do is we defend the scenarios, the threats, and then what we do is we all these controls that we have described by NIST or COVID, pick your favorite framework. Uh, we relay them across the, what we call the kill chain. Kill chain for the technical minded here is basically, it's the same five steps that almost every cyber attack follows. There's an initial compromise, you, you get a foothold, you move around, you elevate access, and then you do your, you avoid being detected, and then you do your thing, whatever that is that you're after. And um, human risk management, it's very much at the start of that kill chain. Uh, so therefore it's, it's such a strong control. And what we typically do is we, we run the numbers through that. So for each of the scenarios, how often do we actually see phishing attempts? Uh, how often actually do we see that these things are being caught by our own people? When we do training, how often do we actually see that, how effective are they? That gives you an indication of actually the effectiveness of that control. And because you know how often these things happen and typically what the, what the damage is that you can do uh, by scenario, you can actually quantify the risk that you actually have. And then it becomes a really simple equation. Let's spend 100K on your risk management on training, maybe 500 on this, whatever it is, but actually, the, the, the one in a 12 month event, or the once in a year event will actually reduce to once in a five year events. And um, that can be quantified in, in money. And that resonates with boards. Yeah, I find, I, I love that approach. I find, I find some of the problem being is like, these human risk managers are like, that, that's not my lane. Like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna step over my, my boundary and say, we're doing it wrong here's how we doing it. And like to do that assessment, it's like, I need to go ask for, for data and for help, right? I need to go to the SOC. I need to go to the security architecture team. I need to go to the GRC team and, and, and ask them. And it sounds, you know, from what is expected from the traditional security awareness training program owner, it sounds insurmountable, right? But what I believe, and I, and I think this audience also believes is like, no, we like, like we have to do these annual trainings, but we really want to affect behavior change. And so like, how can we break, like, how would you, you know, if you have a director, you know, that's three levels down from the CISO and, and their, their charge is the human risk side, how, would, how can they start taking some baby steps? Like, what is the crawl approach to proving 
that a potential you know budget line item for a human responsification platform uh, is needed. What would you? What, how would you respond to that? Yeah, shall I offer? Yeah, so so we, we, we would actually get the data. So if you're the director that you that, that is in charge of this, I would actually get some of the data and sit with the SOC team. Like, hey, what are we seeing actually in terms of uh, phishing attempts, for example? Because that's typically the way uh, things get in. Um, um, but also do it by, by, by groups. So phishing applies to everyone. Then you have uh, people doing silly things that are in engineering positions. We call them the risky tinkerers. How often do you see incidents there? That data is typically there. The, the CISO will have access to, your team will have access to that stuff. And, uh, and, and that allows you to, to sort of quantify actually how often does this stuff happen? Then based on the training, and I, I'm a firm believer that you would target it for different audiences. So the general public, the executive suites, the the engineers uh, that the are risky tinkerers, um, and then you you sort of you can quantify actually how often you see these things happen there. How often does something get hit? And then you can build an assumption like, hey, this training will actually reduce the, it by X. You deploy the training, you measure it, you measure the effects with the real data points that you have collected in the first place, and that's how you can go and uh, and, and and keep quantifying it. Um, yeah, it's fine to have hypotheses here, to be honest as well. Um, but get the, get the real data to back it up. I would say I love that. And, and 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 part of the theme of the conference has for me has been like you know these trolls like whiskey. Grab a bottle, take a seat next to them. Say, hey, listen, I know you're a really busy person. You have all of this work in front of you, all of these security issues. But if you could just pull this report for me, I can leave this bottle for you, and it's a win-win. Uh, let's see how we can incentivize uh, that type of uh, interaction. Rinky, what's your thoughts? I love that. Um, no, I, I, you know, I agree with everything. Um, but it, I, I would also add, never waste a good incident. You know, like I, if there's a good incident that you can share that, you know, and it's like go and make a story out of that and say this is exactly why it's we need budget for this. And sometimes you can show data and you and especially in you know in this tight market that we're in this weird time that we're living in, it can be hard at times to make the case for budget in this space, right? And so I think it's really important to never waste a good incident to showcase that this is how something like this would have helped. And I think it's more of an art than it is a science sometimes because you we have like as security practitioners everything that margin shared, we have all the metrics, we have all the data but yet sometimes you're still not able to get budget in this space. So it, good incidents don't waste it. And I think the other thing that's helped me is really making the your topmost executives a part of the storyline as it relates to security awareness and education. Like somehow like bring them into whatever it is that you're doing around security education. We do fun videos or whatever it is. And all of a sudden they have a heightened awareness just from participating in those kinds of things. And so I think there's creative ways to, to carve this out. And I think once you get it in, then it kind of just proves itself over and over in terms of value. I love, I'm gonna pull that thread, Ricky, never waste a good incident. I, I feel that's such a solid um, statement. I feel like this is something that a human risk program owner can really can really dive in on, right? They can start pulling that thread and identifying what were the what were the results of it? What was the impact of that incident? I'm not just talking about the end result. What where was all the time that was spent from that incident, from that exposure to the end, right? How many people were involved? How many hours were spent? This is a really easy way to quantify what that incident was. And if it happened, you know, in the last three or six months, like you're going to have people that can answer those questions to Marjan's previous point about where the human risk is at the front end of the kill chain, the, the, the business case be, be, becomes, OK, this incident cost 300 hours of time, you know, across multiple levels of people from, you know, $15 an hour to $500 an hour. And this is how we can quantify that impact from just spending time on that incident plus whatever the incident cost itself, whether it was a business email compromise, ransomware, down systems, even trying to quantify some type of um, uh, prospect, um, uh, you know, tarnished reputation. And then we can go and say, hey, listen, I, I just went through this exercise. And if I could reduce this problem from happening even by 50 percent, isn't that something you would want me to work on? And any CISO that sees a, a team member putting that type of effort into wanting to prove a you know prove a, a risk, risk reduction would be silly not to say yeah let's let's spend some efforts let me get you more data and see how we can take this thought pattern 
and and execute on it. So I, I think you know starting to, to to tee these up together. But for the audience, it really starts small. You know, one report, one audience, one data. Do do those efforts instead of coming out after and say, hey, I need you know six figures for this technology. Prove what you want to do first with the data. And I know that's something that we're you know living security self you know self uh, uh, is able to help start with. Um, talk Google, talk about. You know, oh, you have something, Marjan, you to add? Yeah, maybe one thing like on the, on the, st the story is really important, right? People love stories, so don't give them data with, based on vulnerabilities and, and so on. The, the story is really important. Uh, building on that incident point from you, Rinky, you don't have to wait for your own incidents. Um, where anyone in your in your in your value chain uh, that is a competitor that has had one will resonate as well. Any big one that's in the news recently, because all these boards they they all ask the same question. They all meet on other boards and they've had their incidents as well, and they all ask the exact the same question: Could that could that thing happen over here? And and how are we set up for this? So so use that as an opportunity as well. Don't wait for your own, I guess. Yeah, I love that as well. Um, let's talk about kind of that cost benefit. You know, let's say, let's kind of go down and we've kind of like naturally gone down this channel. Okay, we're gonna start small, we're gonna pull some data, we're gonna go through an incident, we're gonna make a count. We've, we've kind of proven this out, but let's, okay, we, we, we've, we've got some ears perked up, right? We got some executive buy-in saying, oh, that's really interesting. I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, let's talk about the next step, right? Because again, it seems daunting to a lot of the, these professionals in here, you know, that aren't, buying 10 different tools a year that maybe this is going to be their one big purchase what does that next step look like how do i how do i think about the strategic fit and the cost versus benefits like how do i build that business plan together and 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 you know what, what are some resources some ideas of 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 where i can do that from yeah i think i think there's um in terms of cost versus benefit i don't have a clean answer for that for me when i look at the cost of a product i look at the complexity what kind of risk it's going to reduce and again it's not a simple equation um and so there's a lot that goes into it um and is it going to reduce the amount of time that people are going to spend in it you know or is it going to reduce the amount of incidents that we're having there's a lot of things that you look at um, in, in terms of that next step and tactically, like, how do you get this as a line item in the budget? How do you determine what the right amount is? I think you start somewhere, right? You start with whatever it is you can get. So you make, you, you know, you're working with your vendors and you see kind of, here's what I think in terms of number of hours, in terms of number of incident reduction or, you know, risk reduction, in terms of visibility that it's going to give me across my enterprise as well. I think you take all of that into account. Like, this is what I think that's worth to me. And you budget for that amount. And sometimes you get that amount, sometimes you don't. But then whatever you get, you start from somewhere, I think. Um, and so I think that's that's the lens that I apply to it. And then I think it's really putting the effort behind showing the value in that first year so that you can increase the scope and and hopefully get more budget in this area that you've shown the value to the organization um and i would say i think even more importantly is when you're bringing this in it's not just the security team driving this thing there's engagement with a lot of different partners and stakeholders in the company whether it's within infosec or it or whatever it might be making sure you have that buy-in ahead of time so that once you're ready to implement something it moves pretty quickly yeah, I like that. When you think about that kind of that phase of of getting other uh, peer buy in across the company, like, and then if you think about taking that business proposal, that technology proposal to the leadership, how much what how would you break down the percentage of education on the technology versus the results and value? Is it is it 50 50? Um, is it 80 20? Like, do we is it less about what is the technology versus what is it going to give to us? Uh, talk, talk me through that, Marjan. Do you want to take that one first? Yeah, look, at that. I think it's really shifted in the last decade, to be honest with you. And I think I alluded to at the start. I, I spent maybe less than 20% on the product features itself and actually 80% on the outcomes. It's outcomes based. The best security products that we have are invisible. Let's be honest. They work behind the scenes. It's it's stuff just happens. And uh, yeah, so I would I would stay away from the, the, the products. Uh, except for the tech crews, because obviously CTOs, they want to know what it's going to have, what it's going to do, what's the impact, uh, what, do, what do we need? And they like those sort of things. But from the business, the people who sign off on these things, I would, I would talk about the outcomes. Rinky, would you as a CISO, if, if you had a, you know, associate director, a manager come to you, are you going to want to dig into the details of exactly what this is? Or will 
a value case, a value business case be, be, be um, sufficient? I'm a little bit of a geek, so I might get interested in how the tech works, but I, but really more importantly is the value, um, as Mark Jin said that, you know, I think it's really important to show what is this going to do for us, right? And again, it's, it's kind of like when I first, when I first did my first board presentation, I brought all these data and metrics and like, it wasn't just about the data, it was about the story, right? And all of a sudden you hear people saying we want more of that right and now it's like okay that's a ton more work that we've got to go put in to do things like that and all of a sudden the value of something that can help you automate and bring that kind of visibility so that you can showcase um interesting things and do interesting things with the teams i think that's that's more important than anything else um and of course like for us geeks, it's always interesting on how the <laughs> tech works and how you're enabling that. But I think mo it's it's you're going to lose people on the tech jargon if you don't start with the value. The domestic yeah, example. Gonna, I, yeah, go ahead, Marjorie, so please. The, the best example I always have here is when you demonstrate two FA, like YubiKeys, for example. And there's a lot going on when you use them, of course. Uh, behind the scenes, there's a lot of really cool tech stuff happening, and, and they're awesome. But the demo is so uneventful because basically you stick it in and you log in. So every time you demo that to an exec, they go, huh, that is. And it's like, yeah, that's exactly the point. <laughs> that's it. It's, there's no matrix screens happening or anything like that. But uh, yeah, that, that's the paradox that we always have to deal with. Best, the best security is to be invisible for the end user almost, or fun in the case of human risk management and engaging. Yeah. Um... I love that. And then that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, how, okay, so I got a couple more questions. Um, and then I'd love to just kind of leave, you know, leave you with your, uh, your, your kind of closing thoughts here. Um, measuring success. What is, what, you know, as, as leaders, as CISO, you know, margin as a CISO, Rinky as a CISO, like, what do you want to see, you know, six months, nine months, 12 months later? How do we know if I'm, you know, if I bought a product that is giving me the value I expect it? Like, are you happy? How do I make sure if I'm if I'm your human risk manager that you're happy with what I'm doing? What do you need to see from me? Rinky, do you want to start? Yeah, I think I, it's what's the culture change within the company? And I know that's a little bit fluffy, but is are is there a buzz around security? Is are we training people in the moment that they need the training, not in the moment that the security team wants to go train everybody. And, and so it's like, are we doing more than just the compliance checkbox stuff? Are we changing the culture within the company? And you know, like a, a soft metric to me too is, are people engaging security earlier on in the company as well? And I think that the more that security engages and does things where there's impact, the more you'll see, okay, we don't want to fall into that trap. So how do we engage with InfoSec earlier on such that we're we're avoiding, you know, getting trained or avoiding being making some of those reports? So I think some of those things are like super important. That's how I see the value. So when I I think that telling that story as to here's how we've reduced risk by implementing something, and then how do we how have we kind of changed the culture of the company? And I think those stories are more important than uh, anything. Yeah, and I think I think it's so getting some of the data points back to that. But I think, that particularly when it comes to remote risk management and security and awareness training, I think just getting feedback, even even unsolicited feedback, is a really good sign. And uh, I think Drew, you'll be pleased to know, right? We we working with you for our own program at KPMG, and the amount of people that come to us that said, "Hey, that training this year was really really good." That never happened before. So, so getting that 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 sort of even elevated talk going is 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 a really good sign. So, on top of the metrics, I think. Yeah, I love it, and then and that's I think the theme as as we kind of close out this conversation. Um, I do have one more one more thought. How can we pair data with stories, right? Like, how can we when we're thinking about crafting our elevator pitch? How do we bring data and stories? It's not about technology, right? It's not about the innovation itself. It's about what is our problem and what are we gonna do about it? And being able to tell it using data in a story where people are gonna be engaged and they're gonna listen. Um, you know, there's dozens and dozens of tools out there that are you know, not necessarily being adopted enterprise-wide right now and, and really hard to break through the CISO's landscape. And so, um, I, I would say, and something I've been thinking about really lately, and I'd love to kind of hear this as within your parting thoughts is, and actually uh, I heard this yesterday, it's like, don't, don't just look at what your problems are 
what is your boss's problem? I think I, if, if I can encourage anybody in this audience today is to make a five minute introduction, a five minute call with their CISO, um, if they're a CISO with their CEO, and say, what are you worried about today? What is the problem that you're struggling with today? And, 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 and then themselves, that becomes, okay, how can I help? What can I do there? So, you know, thinking about the problems CISOs are having in 2023, and as we think about innovative technology, what are y'all's closing thoughts here in this, in this conversation? Uh, Marjan, do you want to start and then we'll finish off with you, Rinky? Sounds good. Yeah, my brain uh, is, is, yeah, is, is, is working hard on this one. I think, I think, I think that empathy case is, really, is a really good one, actually. Uh, showing up at that empathy because, because the CEO is, we always say, oh, the CEO doesn't care about security. The board doesn't care about security. Uh, well, guess what? They, they do at the moment because they're seeing all this bad stuff happening, but they just don't understand what, what it is that they can do. So they're relying on you to tell them and, and, and probably make decisions. So I think that empathy, the boss, or maybe the boss's boss, or even the CEO is, is, is really a good starting point to actually think about what will be on their minds. And it won't be security, it will be something else, but the security would be a massive enabler for that uh, to solve that problem. Yeah. So I would follow that thread, to be honest. So we keep hearing, time. yeah, we keep hearing, you know, uh, this 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 year, last year, every year, like have empathy for the end users, have empathy for the end users. When we think about training and awareness, but like you're saying, have empathy for the leadership, right? Like understand what is on the top of their mind as you are frustrated that they're not giving you the attention. And I think having that empathetic approach when you go have that elevator pitch uh, helps to craft through that emotional barrier. Then, hey, I need more money for X, Y, or Z. Yeah, we need to do uh, cost savings. How about our last thought? What's that? What's that, Marjan? Well, I think we need to do cost savings, and then, then is it really the moment to pitch a to pitch a massive security incident and event monitoring system, or is are you better off pitching um, a tenth of the budget for for security and awareness instead? Maybe so. So those are the trade offs you may want to make uh, by by putting yourself in their shoes. Yeah, love it, Rinky. Last last thoughts here. Yeah, I think everything has to be within the business context. If you just start going and talking on a one kind of single thread around security, no, you're going to become annoying really quick. And so I think it's got to be in context of the business, how you're helping speed the business up, how you're enabling the business. Um, and I think that's the important part. But I also would say, like, whether it's the CEO or some other high ranking executive, it's if there is a security risk that you're worried about, people do care. I think we a lot of times carry the weight of risks on our own shoulders as security practitioners. It's okay to call somebody and say, I am worried about this. And I can't tell you the number of times I didn't do that versus the number of times I have. And it always leads to good outcomes. It leads to good discussions and it leads to the right investments. And so don't shy away from that. Awesome. Well, Ricky Marjan, thank you so much for joining. Um, Marjan, thank you for waking up so early in the morning um, to, to join us. I think this was, again, a very tactical conversation for some of our program owners that are looking to do more and looking to evolve beyond. I am the training person and I do communications and really starting with I am here to reduce risk and to make real change. So really, thank you so much for being here. Thanks Pleasure. for having us. Over the past six years, Living Security has consistently innovated from our first of its kind for and uh, building escape rooms to our unmatched quality and content. Two years ago, Living Security launched Unify, a best in class platform which integrates human risk data from your existing technology stack into a single pane of glass with actionability at its core. Gartner has forecasted that 80% of enterprises will have a human risk management program and tool set in place. Don't just solve your problems by getting compliant with annual training, but solve your bosses by reducing risk through proven behavior change. Our industry is changing and we are leading the efforts. We'll be coming back in just a Twelve teams, four remain. With one million in crypto on the line, teams of two put their cybersecurity knowledge to the test. This week, the teams are in Austin, Texas, where they'll learn about digital identity. Digital identity is really interesting. It's a world that's evolving really fast. From deep fakes and NFTs. Now that may have been my face, but I didn't record that video. He did. I think she's talking about a non-fungible token, an NFT. Non-fungible? To crypto wallets and the metaverse. This is a physical ledger. But it's going to be up to you guys to pick your wallet. When in the metaverse, make sure you know what data is being collected and by who. 
They'll learn how to protect themselves in an ever-changing world. All that stuff about data was really freaking me out. I know sometimes people will steal people's accounts. Something just didn't feel right. It just doesn't seem like something Gil would do. Exactly. So we didn't do it. Join our competitors as they search for clues and complete security challenges in this race around the world. This is the Cyber Race. All rise, please. The case for and against fishing simulations and organizations is now in session. The Honorable Acting Judge Alan Alford presiding. As we engage in this enlightening and engaging mock trial, we introduce our esteemed counsels who will steer us through this intricate discussion. Arguing for the use of fishing simulations, we have Ms. Jenny Hederman, an expert legal and business leader with a rich experience in state finance law and cybersecurity known for her strategic problem solving miss hederman has made considerable contributions to the field of cybersecurity through various platforms including the ctr cyber 5 video series on youtube countering her arguments we have miss sharice castanogli a seasoned cybersecurity consultant and founder of vocovia miss castanogli's experience spans across risk management ach wire fraud and cybersecurity law making her a formidable counsel for the opposing side her work as a general counsel for tech companies and her efforts as a co-founder of Cypher Queens, a women's security empowerment organization, are testament to her deep commitment and expertise in the field of cybersecurity. Maintain respect and decorum as we navigate through this educational discourse. Order in the court, your honorable Judge Alan Alford, the floor is yours. Good day, everyone. I'm Alan Alford, and I will be overseeing this mock trial. First, let me extend a warm welcome to all attendees. We're gathered here today for a unique purpose. Our aim is to delve into a critical debate concerning human risk management, specifically the effectiveness and appropriateness of using phishing simulations within organizations. However, it is essential to remember that this is a mock trial, an educational exercise rather than an actual lawsuit. I am not a real judge. What you can expect today is a fair and informed exploration of this matter. Two skilled teams will represent opposing sides, each arguing for and against the use of phishing simulations. They will present their arguments, provide evidence, and even call on an expert witness to testify. But this isn't a passive process. We highly encourage your involvement. You, as the audience, are playing the role of the jury. I urge you to listen carefully to the evidence, engage with the material, and keep an open mind throughout the proceedings. 
Feel free to pose your questions during the designated breaks, and if you wish to weigh in, the chat is open for your opinions and thoughts. At the end of the trial, we will have a vote. You will be given the chance to decide on the case using a Zoom poll feature based on the arguments presented. I ask you to consider the evidence and arguments carefully before casting your vote. Let's remember that while this trial is fictional, the issue we're discussing is very real and very pertinent to many organizations today. Your active participation will enrich the experience for us all. Let us strive to make this a fruitful discussion. Now let's get started with the proceedings. May the best argument win. Plaintiff. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are here today to assess whether phishing simulations are beneficial, benign, or bad. We are relying on you to make that determination. As many of you know, cybercrime continues to rise. In fact, it's big business. Even Forbes magazine now reports on it, estimating that global cybercrime will cost eight trillion, that's T trillion, by 2023. But let's not get distracted with the validity of that one estimate. Let's just talk about numbers actually reported to the FBI through the IC3.gov reporting program. That's the Internet Computer Crime Center, for those of you who aren't familiar. And we're going to assume that those are just the tip of the iceberg, because of course not everyone wants to report to the government. And let's look at what's just been reported in the past five years. Can we have exhibit A, please? Complaints have more than doubled. Damages have more than tripled. And phishing by itself now represents 40% of all complaints up from less than 10% five years ago. And while the numbers of reported phishing attacks were slightly down in 2022, the losses attributed to phishing were up. Phishing is still a clear and present danger. Our position is that every company needs a robust phishing simulation campaign, whether you're a Fortune 200 company or a small dental office. Phishing simulations need to be your first line of defense against ransomware. Phishing needs to be your first line of defense against business email compromise. How do we know this works? Well, a 2022 survey of organizations found that 84% of US-based organizations states that security awareness training has lowered their phishing failure rates. Now, my esteemed colleague will try to convince you that not all phishing simulation is good, but we will presenting facts and evidence to show you that comprehensive, robust, even mean and tricky simulations are necessary to protect your company from the adversaries of today. We already know hackers have no moral compass. Thank you. Defendant. Thank you, Your Honor, Counselor and the virtual jury of attendees for deliberating on this important topic. We are actually in agreement that a well-crafted phishing simulation with training helps reduce the fail rates for employees. However, it's our position that simulated phishing campaigns target only a symptom of the problem, not the actual problem. Aggressive, sophisticated, targeted cyber attacks through email, text, and calls. Phishing attacks have risen over the past couple of years, a staggering 667%. Some studies have shown that phishing campaigns lose efficacy over time with long-term exposure to phishing campaigns. And experts say that humans are basically hardwired to fall for phishing scams. Bottom line, if you allow your employees to accept emails, texts, and phone calls to conduct your business, you are accepting the risk and likelihood of a phishing attempt and breach. So what is that likelihood? Let's take a look at exhibit B. So vendors promote that phishing training, including phishing simulation, significantly reduces the fail rates from 37 to 5%. Sounds fantastic, right? A 32% drop in fail rates is awesome, right? It's a great marketing campaign, but let's look at the reality of that awesome 5% of your organization in the best situation of fail rates. So if you have training and simulations, a minimum of 5%, and that's the best percentage, will fall for your phishing attacks. For a small organization, that's a handful of employees. But once you get to a large organization of 100 or more employees,
that's a much larger threat landscape. And that's a lot of employees that you have to worry about clicking on links. And this statistic doesn't mean the same people. On any given day, the risk is, exists across your organization and it will fluctuate based on the sophistication of a phishing attempt. So where does this leave us? Employees are currently in the trenches and are sitting ducks. And current cyber awareness training and simulations are just not enough to provide them with adequate weapons and defenses. It's impossible for employees to see all the types of threats that are coming their way, which means you are bound to be compromised. Instead, our position is organizations need to create a dual approach that focuses on the root cause, communication threat channels, and build models that do a better job of protecting employees and organizations by reducing the threat traffic that gets to employees in the first place. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, counselors. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce our first expert witness for today's proceedings, Ms. Nicole Thibault. Ms. Thibault is a seasoned IT security education specialist currently working at DXC Technology. With an impressive track record spanning over a decade, she has honed her skills in communicating complex IT security topics to non-technical audiences and planning strategic security initiatives. From developing and overseeing global IT security education programs to conducting detailed program metrics analysis for improvement in compliance, Nicole's expertise is vast and well-rounded. Prior to her role at DXC Technology, Nicole had a significant tenure at CVS Health where she developed, matured, and managed their entire security awareness program. In one year, she increased the participation of colleagues in the program by a staggering 400%. She has also demonstrated her innovative thinking in implementing an internal phishing program that targeted 75,000 colleagues. Her effectiveness in this role was exemplified by her success in exceeding communication requirements at an almost perfect rate of 99.98%. That's compliance requirements. Nicole's unparalleled experience and insights into IT security, particularly in the areas of phishing simulations and awareness training, make her an invaluable contributor to our discussion today. We look forward to her expert testimony and unique perspectives on our topic. Would you like to examine the witness? We defer. But we will begin questioning now, if that is acceptable to opposing counsel. Excellent. Ms. Thibault, thank you for joining us today and thank you for your guidance and assistance in this matter. Could you start off by telling us in your own words how you think about creating a phishing simulation program? Oops. Hi, yes. When I think about creating a phishing simulation program, I have to think about what's being, what's happening in the real world. So we look at real world threats and I also look at my company's culture and ensure that the templates won't offend most people. Thank you, that sounds very reasonable. And let's talk about what drives phishing simulations. Isn't it the case that certain regulatory schemes, for example, let's talk about HIPAA, mandate, data access and privacy training. In fact, in the updated 2023 training guidelines, HIPAA expressly states that security awareness, including phishing awareness, is required. Isn't that so? Yes, it is. And would you be surprised if I told you that the Office of Civil Rights, for those of you who don't know, that's the oversight organization in the government for HIPAA, complaints, has fined healthcare provided Anthem, I think they even changed their name, over $48 million for their data breach. And now the Internet Computer Crime Center shows that ransomware against healthcare organizations is up 50% year over year. And as a side note, ransomware started rising against healthcare companies during the pandemic, evil, evil hackers. Who knows how many people they killed? Anyway, according to CrowdStrike, ransomware usually gets into an organization by tricking a user to disclose a password or click on a virus-laden email attachment. So Ms. Tebow, wouldn't you say a phishing program is an important, if not critical, 
aspect of security training in healthcare organizations, and in fact, most organizations. Yes. And so how would you structure a phishing simulation program to help a healthcare company protect against these risks, since you've been part of a healthcare company before? So for healthcare, I would think about what is happening in the world. And is there a highly visible event that hackers would want to leverage to use in a phishing email against these healthcare companies? Uh, and part of it is informing the organization of the program itself. It's important to be as transparent as possible with a phishing program. That's really um, important to understand because there have been concerns raised about both the effectiveness and the ethics of phishing simulations, such as what are the ethics of tricking subjects, well, users, and not providing users with informed consent, therefore not giving users the opportunity to opt out. But wouldn't giving such advanced notice like informed consent and being able to opt out defeat the purpose of phishing testing? I believe it would, yes. And do you have an opinion about whether users should be given informed consent? I do. So please feel to expand on the need for control and timing over these over the subject matter in these informed consent situations. The overall phishing program, in my opinion, should be known by the organization, maybe through a communication or kept somewhere on the company intranet where end users can easily go and reference the fact that there is a phishing program at their organization. And the level of informed consent I've seen to be a successful thing in an organization. Thank you. We've also heard complaints about phishing being considered unethical because it tries to trick people into revealing financial information or personally identifiable information. Would you consider such subject matter as necessary for a phishing simulation? No, I do not believe that personal information needs to be part of a phishing simulation, which is at your employer. And isn't it a fact, as shown in the paper, Ethics and Phishing Experiments, that researchers conclude from a random trial of almost 500 college students that evidence concerning the impact of deception on human subject is overblown, that harms are usually minimal and temporary. So what is your opinion? Aren't these ethics concerns overblown by these pontificating liberals that don't care about cybersecurity risk? Objection, counselor. Political positions have no place in this conversation. Jury, you're instructed to disregard that last question. Well, let's move on. Turning to the issue of consent, we have already seen that some in, in some industries, phishing training is mandatory. So shouldn't employees be smart enough to know that if they work in a regulated industry that they're gonna be subject to these types of trainings? I mean, should dumb employees really be allowed to risk our personal health information or financial information? Counselor, we don't need to be pejorative. Employees come in all forms of age, education, and experience, and there is no need to insult them. Well, Ms. Thibault, how would you balance employee concerns about notice and consent with the need to protect the organization? It's about what's best for the business, always. When you have a company and culture in mind, you'll likely be on the right track not to offend anyone. And some people may be caught off guard, but when you have things like just-in-time training, to help the employee know that this was a simple exercise and here are some indicators that you should have noticed in the email. Thank you. So finally, let's turn to this issue of repeat clickers. In the enduring mystery of repeat clickers, yep, that's a real paper, um, a set of researchers from the University of Central Florida and the US Army Soldier Command found that less than 1% of users are repeat clickers. And by some 
And some have suggested that this means phishing simulations fail. But as a security training expert, wouldn't you want to know who those users are? Maybe even as the ETH Zurich paper suggests, they feel the company and IT protect them, so they don't need to be vigilant, but don't we need to know who they are? True risky clickers are a small group in my experience, as you mentioned, 1%. Now, how your company wants to classify risky clickers is an important step to take before documenting how you will respond to those risky clickers. This is where other email security technology tools can come in handy and partnering with your security incident management team or security operations team is important. The devil is in the details, so the data needs to be accurate and well analyzed before tagging anyone as a risky clicker. Thank you, Ms. Thibault. I yield my time to opposing counsel. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, Witness Thibault, thank you so much. I think we're all in agreement uh, in this court that minimal cyber awareness training needs to be done. So I'll point my question solely to simulated phishing. So studies have shown that poorly enacted simulated phishing that goes wrong is a breeding ground for future insider attacks from disgruntled employees. Doesn't that counteract the benefits of simulated phishing? I don't believe the benefits are pushed aside if only a small percentage of the employee population feels the phishing simulation was performed in poor, poor taste or, or judgment the phishing team. And simulated phishing campaigns are supposed to get harder every quarter, meaning that the fail rates may also rise if you're using more sophisticated examples. And leadership may also be confused with the true measure of improvements because they see an increased fail rate. Doesn't this risk cyber awareness training being seen as ineffective and training being dropped, which would create even bigger security risks? So it's, it's an important reason to communicate to your leaders and above about the phishing strategy and goals. Leadership should know what phishing simulations that, that they will get trickier and it's expected for the results to fluctuate because of that. Um, in studies, we've talked about this a little bit before, studies also show that even with the best training and phishing campaigns, there will always be a percentage of untrainable staff, those risky clickers, either because they are in executive positions and really don't see training as important to them or staff who fail consecutive phishing tests, even with repeated training uh, because they don't care or because they just, they, they can't be trained. So doesn't this make phishing campaigns um, always failing to improve certain staff behaviors? And that's that even if it's a 1%, in a large organization, that may be uh, just one click enough to give you a multi-million dollar breach. Mm. Um, you know, untrainable, everyone's trainable. We're all part of one big team. So, and it doesn't matter, um, in my opinion, if someone is in a higher position of authority, they shouldn't be exempt from any training or training exercises. Thank you. And um, I read a 2021 ETH Zurich study that found that simulating phishing training was not effective and can in fact have negative side effects, suggesting that tests make users more susceptible attacks because either the employees gain a false sense of confidence that they're winning and they're, they're not failing from the trainings because they've been successful, and they feel less responsible for stopping future attacks. Doesn't that make these type of simulations less effective than we think they are? To me, the biggest part of a phishing simulation is not trying to catch people. It's pushing the point that we need employees to report suspicious emails and activity. I'm not on the technical side of security, but I do know that there is a margin of error even when we have the best technology in place. So cyber criminals are doing their diligence on their side to catch us uh, and we need to 
make sure our employees know how to catch them. And if we know that hackers, especially with artificial intelligence being added to the mix, um, are moving quickly and consistently crafting more sophisticated attacks to evade detection, aren't the, the current phishing campaigns always out of date and therefore less effective? Again, if the phishing team is encouraging employees to report suspicious activity, then the phishing tests are still a good choice when we're thinking in terms on human risk. Isn't it just a complete waste of time and money to invest in running these phishing campaign exercises, which waste valuable work time? Objection, counselor. The witness is not an expert on time, people's waste thereof, or value therein. Jury, please disregard that question. Um, and even if, um, the, the, when staff fail a phishing, um, a phishing test, they know that they're told it's being kept confidential, but they know that there's a certain number of managers who know that the employees fail. And while social engineering is something that must be done to support this uh, attack chain simulation, doesn't the human cost of embarrassment to employees who fail the phishing test outweigh the value, especially since the true value of the test can't be quantified? So let's not embarrass people. And it has never been part of any phishing strategic plan that I've been involved in um, to notify managers of failures. If a manager or a coworker knows someone that failed the phishing test, it's likely that the person that failed talked to their manager or they talked to their, co to their coworker. So in that respect, you're you're getting some good conversations happening between managers and coworkers about phishing and hopefully all those conversations are are turning into some good stories isn't it a bigger risk that simulated phishing campaigns that have either discipline or even just repeated remedial training for failing the phishing test create the wrong incentives for employees who may be reluctant to report as you say that they they should be when they think they've fallen victim to a phishing attack because they are afraid of being disciplined or being um, trained again. And therefore in their failure to report, it makes the company less secure. Mm. Yep, I, I never want anyone to be reluctant to report. Um, I think this is, really important to make employees feel empowered to report. Um, sometimes a, a small incentive for reporting, a quick thank you message or something of that sort to let them know that they're in a safe place when they do report something suspicious. Um, and severe discipline. Um, if the company is responsible for mostly highly sensitive data, um, maybe there is a reason for um, some disciplinary actions, um, but that must be very carefully documented and thought of. And aren't poorly crafted simulating phishing tests largely pointless in their efficiency for improving security and just an indicator of a uh, lazier security team or approach? Objection, objection. Counselor, insulting the good folks in the cybersecurity industry is not <laughs> going to get you anywhere. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Jury, um, you're instructed better... to disregard that question. And when this, wouldn't a better approach that protects both the employee and the organization be to focus on the true problem? which is the inflow of phishing emails, texts, and phone calls, and focus on the communication solutions that would prevent staff from being victimized in the first place. Absolutely. We should have both tools that close these gaps as much as possible and still have a workforce who is armed and ready to report suspicious emails or activity as needed. Also, 
you're not only teaching them to watch out for these emails at work, you're also giving them something that they can use in their personal lives and protect their own personal data. Thank you. And also, isn't it a better <laughs> to develop more targeted training for each type of team or work that on a, in an organization that simulates the content they will actually get and then routinely training on this content rather than testing staff periodically? Mm. Yes, of course. And you can have both. You can spare fish departments, teams, people in specific roles. It's a great way to target fishing simulations and training and gain an understanding for where maybe further training is needed. Thank you. And in your opinion, could you just give us some final thoughts on what you think an organization really should be thinking about when they're uh, managing their cyber awareness that includes simulations, as well as the other types of risks in the communication streams that they have? Mm -hmm. It really goes back to the culture of the company and making sure that you are thinking of these phishing simulations in an ethical, moral way. Um, there will be people that you do offend, and if that portion is a smaller percentage, then you're on the right track. Um, and, and always make sure that your phishing program team is open and available for questions and can help end users through these somewhat difficult times that they may have with a phishing simulation. Thank you, Witness Tebow. Thank you, Your Honor. Plaintiff, do you have any closing statements? Thank you, Your Honor. And thank you, opposing counsel, for an excellent discovery of the facts. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as you have seen throughout these deliberations, our expert states that a well-managed phishing program is an essential component of an overall security program. Now, my esteemed opposing counsel has made several points I'd like to address. First of all, as in all security programs, any poorly designed or implemented program can introduce risk into an organization whether it's a false sense of security or actual errors due to misconfiguration of tools. No one is suggesting this is a strategy an organization should pursue. In fact, as Ms. Thibault stated, metrics and continuous improvement are essential foundations of any security awareness program. Second, I'd like to address the ETH Zurich study referenced by opposing counsel. First of all, Thank you, Ms. Thibault, for your comments on reporting. That same ETH Zurich study, which was a large study, 15,000 users across 15 months, found that reporting is very effective. I believe opposing counsel, however, cherry-picked from that ETH Zurich study, leading to a false narrative. The finding, suggesting tests make users more susceptible to attacks because employees either gain false confidence or blah, 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 focused on one aspect of that study. Specifically, redirecting users to embedded training real time after a failed fish does not improve outcomes. The study suggested there was a false confidence developed from such real-time embedded training in a small percentage of users. But that's only one aspect of a phishing program, and in fact, one that not all tools and organizations use. No one is arguing, arguing that there isn't a risk of complacency or a risk of trusting the tech too much. Again, as Ms. Thibault clearly stated, metrics to monitor effectiveness, open communication with the organization, and adapting your program to the changing threat environment are essential elements of a good phishing program. Of course, organizations should also focus on additional risk mitigation strategies in their security awareness program. But overly focusing on hurt feelings or worrying about informed consent does not 
stop hackers. In the end, the human risk factor is never going to drop to zero. But with the changing, changing threat landscape, the very high cost of a ransomware event and increased targeting by hackers using generative AI, it's time to spend more time carefully tailoring and monitoring our phishing programs because hackers are not standing still. I hope you will support our position and thank you for your time and thoughtful consideration of this matter. Your Honor. Defendant, do you have a closing statement? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor, Counselor, and virtual jury. As you consider how you will vote, we actually are all in agreement that we have a responsibility as organizations to provide cyber awareness training. And also we're in agreement that simulated phishing tests, if done well, can reduce the fail rates. However, it's also universally proven that employees are fairly defenseless against the rapidly increasing and sophisticated phishing threats that even the experts are having a hard time spotting. Employees will fail even with training. We invite you to consider that cyber awareness training and phishing tests are not a silver bullet and in some situations can create a false sense of security if they're not done well for both leadership and employees and may become less effective over time if they're not, as my co-counsel says, not evolving fast, as fast as the emerging threats. And if we know that at least a minimum of 5% of our employees will always fail and will click, organizations are facing unprecedented and catastrophic cyber threats that should be better mitigated by cutting off or reducing the threat traffic channels. So we're relying really heavily on our human resources as opposed to giving them the protections that they need. And organizations fear change, especially when it means altering their communication channels. But hackers are betting on our resistance and inability to pivot to thwart their attack. We need to be more strategic and evaluate the benefits and ROI of reducing our threat traffic channels to better protect our employees and our organizations, rather than leaving them in the currently wide open trenches like sitting ducks. So consider the real cause of the threats, not just the symptoms, and build a strategy that gets at the source of the threat, the inbound communication streams, and reduce the ability of these threats to reach your employees in the first place, and then expect them to be able to see them. By having a coordinated cybersecurity approach that gets at the communication streams, as well as training employees what to look for with new threats, including phishing simulations, you can get at the root of these threats from two directions, creating defenses to threat traffic and training your employees so that we can reduce the 5% risk even further. Something that even the best phishing simulations alone cannot accomplish. And I rest my case, Your Honor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you both, Counselors. Thank you, Witness Tebow. Jury. You have now heard the arguments and witnessed the presentation of evidence by both councils. The time has come for you to deliberate on the question as to whether or not phishing simulations and organizations should be used. You will be given the opportunity to vote using the Zoom poll feature to express your individual verdict on the case. In your deliberation, it is essential that you consider the following. The level of effectiveness of phishing simulations as an awareness and training tool in cybersecurity, as argued by Ms. Henda Hederman, the potential risks and counter arguments associated with these simulations as put forth by Ms. Castagnoli. The evidence presented by both parties, including expert testimony and empirical data. Remember, you are not here to decide on the legality of these practices, but rather to weigh on their merits and disadvantages in a practical real world context. This is not a legal trial, but an exercise in critical thinking and decision making. Now, as you prepare for deliberation, please take this opportunity to ask any final questions you might have of myself or the councils. You may send your questions through the chat. Keep in mind that your decision should be based solely on the information presented within this session. And most importantly, I ask that you exercise impartiality, reason, and conscientious judgment in your deliberation. Now I entrust this decision to you, the jury. You may now begin your deliberation. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, 
as we adjourn and you head into deliberation, let me echo the words of the judge. This case has presented us with valuable insights and perspectives on the utilization of phishing simulations in organizations. As you step into this critical role, remember that your thoughts and opinions can make a significant difference. This is your opportunity to contribute to a broader dialogue on the matter in the course of your deliberation. You might ponder upon these questions. How might organizations better balance the benefits and potential drawbacks of phishing simulations? Are there specific contexts or situations where phishing simulations might be more or less beneficial? Let's not forget the ripple effect your verdict can have on the broader conversation around cybersecurity. Remember, your voice matters. It's not just about deciding the case, but also about sparking thoughts, inciting conversations, and driving change. With that, I encourage each of you to step into this role with an open mind and a readiness to engage. Please, take your time, deliberate wisely, and when ready, cast your vote using the Zoom poll feature. Do I have any questions for the, uh, for the judge, the counsels, or the expert witness? Yes, I do. I have a question, a question. Have you ever heard of employees having hurt feelings that made them worse at their job or more at risk to their organization? I believe that's a question for witness Tebow. No, no, I have never seen somebody become worse at their job because their feelings were hurt. I think Councillor had a comment. I saw her nodding there. Councillor Hederman. Uh, yes, actually, we've had experienced this after doing a phishing simulation in our office where some employees were very upset about um, failing and being perceived as failures. And it took them a while to get back into um, their daily operations. Um, I also have a story. Um, I almost lost my job because we ran a phishing simulation at the end of the quarter with a um, spiff targeting our salespeople. And of course, over 90% of them fell for it. Um, the VP of sales was absolutely incensed and um, called for heads to roll. <laughs> but the sales guys were kind of cool about it after we explained the purpose. And they were like, oh yeah, wow, we've got to be more careful. So it didn't affect their quotas in the end and they were fine. but. We certainly ruffled some executive feathers. All right, I have another question from the jury. Do you know of any organizations that went out of business due to a cyber attack because they did not have a, fish, a simulated phishing program? Mm -hmm. Counselors, witness? Well, not quite that way and i can't mention what the company was but there was a company that did not have adequate uh fishing simulations in their adequate they weren't doing fishing at the time fishing simulation trainings and they were hit with a ransomware and their cyber insurance company refused to pay they had to take the entire cost and it was north of 30 million dollars um on their own, uh, all the cost of mitigation, recovery, and fines was borne by the organization because they had not implemented a phishing program. I believe the last I looked that most cyber insurance policies now require some form of security awareness. And again, in regulated industries such as healthcare and finance, it's fairly mandatory that you include fishing simulations in those. So I would say that was a pretty negative outcome for that organization. And okay. Your Honor, oh, go ahead. And then, Your Honor, there are, you know, recently credit rating bureaus are starting to inquire about uh, breaches and the mitigation strategies that entities have used, and they're going to be using it in their, their credit rating. So that will come up and audits uh, in government and in the private sector are starting to include IT audits and the type of security strategies you're following. So it is coming that people are going to be looking at what organizations are doing. All right, I have another question from the jury. They're a very inquisitive group of uh, folk, everyday citizens doing their 
their, uh, their, their duty. Do you view phishing simulations as training or as assessments? Ooh. Counselor? Well, it comes out of our training budget. Um, but now that I've heard this question, we certainly, we do also include metrics and we do track metrics on it. So I believe that I'm going to include them as part of our assessment metrics now. <laughs> Thank you, juror. <laughs> Councilor Hederman, witness Tebow, any thoughts on that one? I would say it's both. I think that they get training because they get the experience of uh, reviewing the email and then seeing it afterwards, whether they failed or they passed. I think it's training, but definitely the analytics that you get um, are part of the assessment. So I, I think it's it, it does both. I agree. OK, here is a very specific question. Does a CFO clicking on a fish create the same amount of enterprise risk as that same CFO having zero cash on hand for the next quarter of expenses? If so, would that CFO get fired for too many quarters of repeated behavior? I'm not a CFO. I'm not going to respond to that. <laughs> I can respond, um, respond a little bit to CFOs. I'm in government, so I can't speak to the private sector, but um, knowing the cost of uh, breaches, the amount of money it takes to mitigate the breaches, it really depends on how big your budget is in comparison. And uh, that single click can put you out of business for weeks or up to a month. And even um, to, depending what your business is, if you're in government, that means you're not able to provide necessary services in the private sector, you're not able to um, help your clients. So either way, um, clicking is a huge issue. It's not just a click. It is really opening the door to um, a huge issue for your organization. Uh, the other part is more manageable. If you, if you don't manage your budget well, there are many, many ways to manage your budget effectively. Uh, and that's more an internal controls issue than a cybersecurity issue. So I think they are really two separate issues, but it's a great question to think about. So thank you for the question. I, I will also point out that what we see uh, in my experience in ACH wire fraud, what I see more frequently than just a, a, a targeted fish to a CFO for you know nefarious purposes like entering the organization, we really see that more focused on business email compromise where there is a um, an attempt to um, have the CFO send a large wire and i've just got to say if you don't have dual authorization on your wires um it, even if it's at a you know even if it's at a threshold level at a risk threshold level and if you don't freaking pick up the phone and call someone directly when you get these like hurry up requests anytime i see hurry up i think slow down mm -hmm. anytime i see hurry up slow down out of band verification, dual authorization would have prevented almost every ACH wire fraud case I've been involved with, and I've done over ten. And Jerry, I would I would caution you as well to to not think of the CFO in particular, uh, to think more about individuals in the company who have access to key resources. Uh, the CFO is not the only one with access. Somebody in HR who has the entire catalog of employee social security numbers somebody in uh, the finance, you know, payables department, um, anybody who's got access to the coffers should 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 really be uh, scrutinized when it comes to these sorts of analyses. I have one more question, it looks like. Do you think there is a benefit to just having an opt in program versus all users taking it? Maybe if the program is separate from the all user, something more advanced, maybe? My clients are in regulated industries. That's a non-starter. Um, I do like the idea of having potentially opt-in additional training that users could volunteer into, but um, and, and I, 
I'm again, I would for all of you who are practitioners, uh, go back and talk to whoever's in charge of your cyber insurance um, as you evaluate your decisions around this, because more and more we're seeing uh, exclusions in the cyber insurance contracts if you don't meet their pretty um, specific requirements. And I would agree with that. I think that in all the industries that we're in, whether it's private sector or in government, there is an expectation that you are going to protect data and systems and protect your clients' information. That's that's a baseline expectation, even before you get to the regulatory overlay that's there. Um, I think the opt-in and out really should be reserved for private information, personal information that you are using for mm. data analytics internally. But anything related to your business which is access management, basic access um, and asset management is premised on the fact that you're not giving access unless they are following the rules of your organization. So I think you, if you have an opt out program, uh, you're not gonna get the collective benefits of any, any cybersecurity program. I just have one further comment um, for those of you who work or work with companies who are publicly traded, the SEC is promulgating new rules around cybersecurity incident disclosure and, and this is a big argument right now in the community, um, they're asking for you to include in your 10 Qs information about your program. Do you have a board of director who's cybersecurity knowledgeable? What kinds of basic programs are you including in there? So this is this whole issue of programs and compliance with your program is about to level up. And I would extend that also to your third party vendors where you're hosting data or any application that you're using to do your business. You may have fantastic cyber awareness training simulations. Your employees are doing a great job but the weaknesses are at the third party level. And that's where we're seeing a lot of the major breaches are not at the main organization, but a third party that's supporting them or software. Well, thank you so much to uh, my esteemed counsel, our expert witness and Judge Allen. The last request from the jury, uh, they want more gavel, uh, the, the jury want more gavel. So Judge Allen, can you help us there? Is that like more cowbell? More cowbell. I got a fever for more gavel. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much to this group. Um, this was, you know, quite uh, an exercise to put together, and this team had a lot of fun doing it. And um, the results were pretty outstanding. Um, you know, in terms of the results of the poll, uh, sixty-one percent responded, "I have fished before and will always fish." Uh, Thirty-two percent said, "I have fished before, but I'm now considering." updating strategies six percent says i have never fished but i think i might try and uh two percent said i've never fished and never will so i think we got some people thinking here the chat was going pretty wild thank you so much to this audience we're going to take just a quick break um making a quick introduction then we have one last uh, special guest speaker coming to close this conference out thank you all for hanging with me about another 15 minutes and uh, we'll be able to wrap up this production. Uh, I'll see you guys in just a couple of minutes.
25 RSVPs will receive a pretty amazing gift to kick off that night if you're going to be in town uh, in person for that summit. Link is in the chat and I hope to see you there. To close this conference, I have invited Summer Grace Fowler to give us some parting thoughts. Let's welcome Summer, Senior VP of Cybersecurity and IT at Motional, with 22 years of, in cyber and IT. You start. There was an issue, there wasn't sound from the, from the, for, for the slides. The slides didn't have sound. Okay, so uh, you ready You ready to start? Are you, what, what are you doing to restart? We're in. Okay. Masquerade is a groundbreaking mass interactive experience. It is just another tool in the toolkit that Living Security is using to help you establish the most solid human risk management program. And what better way to launch our new experience than by hosting our own Masquerade? I'm excited to announce on August 24th in Las Vegas, Nevada, during SANS Securing the Human or the Human Risk Management Summit, uh, that we'll be hosting our very own Masquerade. Uh, it's going to be a night of mystery and intrigue with experiences, great food and drink, and of course, some amazing prizes. Uh, the first 25 RSVPs will receive a pretty amazing gift to kick off the night. Link is in the chat and I hope to see you there. To close the conference, I have invited Summer Craze Fowler to give us some parting thoughts. Let's welcome Summer, Senior VP in Cybersecurity and, uh, of Cybersecurity and IT at Motional. With 22 years in cyber and IT, she's a seasoned expert and leader in business continuity cyber crisis management. Recently recognized as one of the top 25 women leaders in cybersecurity, Summer's expertise and insights are highly valued. The digital space is your Summer. Summer, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Drew. I'm really excited about this masquerade. We do have an office in Las Vegas, so I'm gonna make sure that I, I make arrangements to be there and, uh, and, and have my costume going. So thank you. Um, I hope everyone has really enjoyed the day. Um, as you know from the title of this conference, we're focused on human risk management, and all of us are focused on this. And it's really not even just the risk management portion, but it's also the human management portion inside of that. Um, a significant portion of today's sessions focused on this. Um, Ashley Rose's talk, um, and, and in particular, some really fun discussions like Sunet's Basement Trolls or Helpful Heroes discussion. Um, and of course, how do we humanize cybersecurity as Ashley and, and Dustin discussed? So these are things that as you come out of the day, I hope you have some new elements in your toolkit that help you also not just manage the risks and not just manage the humans, but manage the human risk itself and do it in a way that makes things both positive for the people on your teams, positive for the other members that are not in your cybersecurity teams and positive overall for your organizations. There were some other key themes throughout the day uh, that I really hope you, you take away. Uh, one is innovation. Another is empowerment and how we can actually take the human and empower them and make them a part of our uh, cybersecurity team, whether or not uh, they're a cybersecurity expert or not. And then uh, another is, is thinking about uh, engagement and interaction. So as, as we decompose those major points, um, you know, we talked a lot today about novel methods and tools in cybersecurity. And the panel that Rinky and Martin ran, um, as well as uh, the, the launch of Unify Insights really shows that there's a lot of space here we talk a lot and a lot of space for that innovation. There's a lot of discussion in the news. There's a lot of discussion, uh, you know, just in general in our space about how quickly technology changes. You know, we've heard uh, originally it was every 18 months things are doubling and we've seen that time frame shrink in terms of compute power. And we often talk about how great it is that the technology is changing. But there's a lot of space and a lot of room for us in the innovation of human risk management as well. And I hope that you really saw the value in that come out um, as you saw Unify Insights. And when it comes to employee empowerment, that was another critical focus of, of, the, of the conference. Uh, we don't want to just look at our humans as threats, um, you know, our employees, even though they can be a, a big risk, they're also our greatest assets. And we want to empower them to recognize the things that could go wrong and to be proactive in addressing these things. 
we want every employee to be a dotted line member of our cybersecurity teams and, and be engaged with us in helping to combat the things that can go wrong, whether it be a threat, whether it be um, a disruption of service, whatever it is. And we had some great talks on that by Jenny Hederman and Catherine Glenn. Probably my favorite thing to think about is how do you build an awareness team without spending a dime? Uh, not only do I love that, but my CFO loves that as well. And so taking those tips and tricks that Catherine provided and implementing them in your organization so that you can expand the awareness of the entirety of your organization and the employees inside of it, really key concept. And then when it comes to the power of engagement and interaction, uh, the, the event underscored the importance of engaging employees in your cybersecurity practices so not just making them a part of the team, but having them also be engaged members of your team. Uh, and so taking us through a mock trial um, on phishing simulations really showed how you can get that, that power of engagement in different interaction. Um, I don't know about you, uh, but if I'm ever in court, I would love to see Alan as my judge. Um, I think he, he felt a lot of power with that gavel and wants to use it a little bit more, but it was really great to see how there was deliberation on such a critical issue and to think about all, all sides of the story with our star witnesses and, and our prosecution and defense debating uh, these phishing simulations. Above all else, and, and you see this all the time with the living security team, this isn't just about technology, this isn't just about uh, the capabilities that they're bringing to the community, it's about the community itself. And, and Drew has talked about this and really wants to hone in on fostering a sense of community among cybersecurity professionals. Uh, you know, th there's that joke out there uh, that says, how can you tell if a cybersecurity professional um, is an extrovert? Um, she'll look at your shoes when she's talking to you, not her own shoes. You know, it, it, it can be a lonely place um, and, and oftentimes, you know, we can feel like uh, we don't have the same sense of community that many other disciplines do. But frankly, um, it's there. And, and Drew and Ashley and others at Living Security really want to pull us all together and make sure that we do have this community to share best practices, to interact with each other, and to make sure that we have opportunities to learn from each other, and by the way, to amplify each other, and to say, these are great things that my colleague is doing. Not only am I learning from them, but the entire community should as well. Uh, so Drew encouraged you today to interact in the chat, ask questions, and really even forge new interactions and friendships and, and relationships with colleagues that you can have. And looking forward, uh, there are other opportunities for this, for networking events, collaborative experiences. And Drew just mentioned that with the, the masquerade event that, that they will be hosting in Las Vegas. So no matter what portion of the day, whether it was a couple of sessions or all of the day, I hope you really enjoyed it and I hope you took value out of it as well. Thank you so much for being here, and I hope to see you at an event soon. Thank you, Summer. It's been, this was a blast. I mean, I had a great time putting this content, this program together. Again, a big shout out to all the speakers that spent time preparing for this, all of the team at Living Security that put in the time and the effort to make this conference possible. We had um, almost 400 people uh, on today's session. Uh, another 500 will be receiving the links uh, on Monday. Uh, for the videos to watch at home uh, on demand. Uh, and I'm just really appreciative for everybody and all their effort to, to put this together. Um, like Summer said, you know, there's a lot going on here um, at Living Security. There's a lot of opportunity for you to dive into our community, uh, to, to network with people, to keep, continue these conversations if, so you don't feel alone. Sometimes in the human risk management field, we feel alone. We're not technical, maybe. Uh, or we have an isolated job, but you know we're here to encourage each other and, and to give each other ideas and, and support. Uh, definitely looking forward to seeing you in Vegas if you're going to be out there for the SANS um, Human Risk Summit. Uh, and outside of that, thank you so much to to everybody. And uh, you know, if you're not a Living Security client already, you know, just ask yourself why not. What are we waiting for? We'd love to be part. You know, bring you in as part of the family uh, and help you like we've helped our hundreds of other clients over the last six years. 
You guys have a great afternoon, a great weekend, and uh, I'll see you on the next one.